dollar a day. Cable television. Millions of dollars worth of TV. For a whole lot less. is CNN. Live from Washington, Crossfire. On the left, Mike Kinsley. On the right, John Sununu. Tonight, the year of the woman? In the Crossfire, Labor Secretary Lynn Martin and Jane Danowitz, Executive Director of the Women's Campaign Fund. Good evening. Welcome to Crossfire. California has two Senate seats up this year, and in Tuesday's primary, the Democratic nominations for both seats went to women. Former San Francisco Mayor Dianne Feinstein and Representative Barbara Boxer. Eighteen women won nominations for California's 52 congressional seats. There are only three California congresswomen now. Earlier in the primary season, Carol Mosley Braun upset incumbent Democratic Senator Alan Dixon in Illinois. And Lynn Yackel won the Democratic nomination to oppose Republican Senator Arlen Specter in Pennsylvania. Why this year? Well, this is the year of the outsider, when not being one of the boys may be a plus. People also point to lingering resentment over male senators' cavalier treatment of Anita Hill last fall. And they point to the growing fear that the Supreme Court will repeal the abortion rights decision of Roe against Wade. But Senator Bob Dole complained the other day in the Washington Post that all the attention is going to liberal women. Republicans also have run women for the Senate. In fact, one of them is on crossfire tonight. John? Jane Danowitz, Bob, Bob Dole is right. Uh, your organization's called the Women Campaigns Fund, yet you seem less interested in electing women and more interested in electing ultra-liberals who happen to be women. Well, Bob Dole, the senator, is not right. Uh, the Women's Campaign Fund is the nation's largest organization giving money to women candidates and about a third of our money traditionally and in 1992 has gone to republican women women who are moderate women who are representing the majority view of the republican party there's about eighty republican women challenging for the house this year you're you're supporting less than a dozen of them uh... I don't, that's not true uh, the women's campaign fund supports pro-choice women who are viable and one of the things that we're seeing in 1992 that the republican party yes has fielded numbers but most of the women are running in, in very strongly Democratic districts, um, and therefore they don't have an opportunity. The Women's Campaign Fund has supported women running in California, pro-choice women such as Judy Ryan, Sandy Smalley, Maureen Reagan, uh, all of whom could not get through the primary. If choice is your issue, though, how come you're opposing our inspector, one of the strongest supporters of, your, of, of that issue? The Women's Campaign Fund is about women and about women only. We don't support men. Um, and uh, Arlen, Arlen doesn't qualify. <laughs> and he's not too popular for, for reasons that I think will become obvious, John. You know, I really don't understand Bob Dole's complaint, Lynn. He says that women's groups are pursuing their own political agenda instead of just supporting all women no matter what their positions are. Well, why should they support a woman irrespective of, her, of, of what she stands for? Well, there's two different things happening here, and you can all take sides and... Uh, the reality is it is more difficult, you may not want to hear it, but it's more difficult for Republican women who may well have the same agenda as some of these groups in terms of choice legislation, in terms of the Equal Rights Amendment, to get their support. I mean, bluntly, I'm a pretty good example of that. I, I think you'll find out when I ran for the Senate, I didn't have that support. And yet I'm pro-choice. Now, pro now the choice. point you're is... Not, you're not, you're not pro... Uh, pro what? What uh, am I not uh, pro? Parental leave. We, we debated I, that on I, Crossfire. As a matter of fact, I had voted for parental leave, so you happen to be you, wrong you again, You also deba you debated point, on the other side the point, on Crossfire. The point, no, the point was, I said that the administration doesn't believe in mandated benefits, but believes there should be choice in parental leave. Let me just say something here, because I, I think that makes you uncomfortable, that we have to face certain realities. First of all, I think it's fine that certain groups go for their own agendas. I don't think they have to support one party or another. And, that, and, and so I don't think you just say, hey, you should just support Republicans. But I can tell you, and I, and I hope we've sort of laid the way, there were seven women who ran for the Senate last time. Six happened to be Republicans and some mighty good candidates. I'll exclude myself from that, but at least five were pretty dynamite people. Um, it was very hard for all of them to get support from certain groups, would, which at least um, by their names, one would have thought would have supported yes, women. I, I like it's part of that. Isn't it ironic that, but that part there of that was timing? I think this year might have been different. As, Republican, as Republicans, I thought you were against quotas. I thought you were against judging people simply on the basis of their oh, sex. I, I certainly Why am. should a group that has an agenda, that's what politics yeah. are about, we all have agendas, uh, I, why should they 
support a woman just because she's a woman. I couldn't agree more. Sounds unless, like affirmative no, action no, wait, no, to me. Well, first of all, it isn't, but, but I couldn't agree more unless they said we are really for having more women. Once you say that, which I, I would agree with you is a perfectly legitimate agenda. I know, for instance, there have to be Democrats. So I want there to be Democratic women. If I've got to have Democrats, please give me don't women. Go that far. <laughs> well, I don't say there had to be a lot of them. I said there had to be give Jane a chance to get in here. What about the last election? Uh, in, in New Jersey, a wonderful uh, a woman was running against Senator Bradley. It's Christy Todd, Christy Todd Whitman. That's Todd right. Whitman. Well, if and, and she got no support from the women's organizations. She got no support in the media. She came within three points. If she had gotten help from your organization, she could have beat them. That's not exactly true. And I think I'd like to talk about Rhode Island, where Claudine Schneider ran against Claiborne Pell, and, and in Hawaii, where Pat Psyche. But what's wrong well, with let, the one me, I raised? Well, let me finish. It, ran against uh, um, Akaka and almost won. You don't these want to were, talk about New Jersey. Uh, these were two women. No, I don't. I, not yet. I want to first talk about Hawaii and Rhode Island because these were well, campaigns that Illinois. the Women's Campaign Fund <laughs> supported and other women's organizations. And I will tell you, um, I was personally hurt by the senator's ar um, article because the Women's Campaign Fund not only gave these women maximum support, but we lost over $50,000 worth of Democratic money because we were going against Democratic male incumbents. And that's how strong our organization's commitment were to these candidates and other organizations like the National Women's Political Caucus. I still, and, and by the way, some of the time you do a fine job, and you and I work together on issues. But I will say that overall, for Republican women candidates, it occasionally feels like a bit of a nightmare world. On one hand, you take some heat, and on the other hand, you can't get support because you're not left-wing, sort of under this, this other. And, and, and I'm going to sound almost a bit naive. It actually surprised me when I was running. I think I was two years ahead of my time, and so were a lot of other women Absolutely. saying, oh my God, take a look at that Senate. Don't you, I mean, is this what a success story is about? You think we're doing that well? well Let's do different. And it was very, very hard to most, have women. Most and I of think the candidates running, running for the Senate between 1980 and this year were Republican. 20 Republicans ran for the Senate, 16 Democrats ran for the Senate. Women. And, and uh, women. And, and of those women, virtually none of them were supported. Uh, it was hard. It, it was hard, and it is hard, but I think the secretary brings up a good point, and that is that 90 was different, um, and I'm not sure. I'll um, be honest, if you go back and take a look at New Jersey, if you went back and took well, it at Illinois at New again. Let's talk about New Jersey. Uh, why did, those why races did you, might be decided. Why was Christy Whitman different? shut out? She wasn't shut out. Christy Ty Whitman herself didn't even think she had a shot at, at yeah, defeating Bill Bradley. Part of, part Her whole campaign was back to a campaign for governor. Now, now as you, no, wait, that, year. by the way, is not fair either. And, and I don't think you should do that to any woman candidate. I hope she can be governor because she'd be a doggone good one. And the Women's Campaign Fund will support her when she runs. But I think Did you're changing, Did you support Governor too. Finney in Kansas when She's she ran? She's anti-choice, and we don't support anti-choice so Democrats support or women. Republicans. But it, sometimes it, they don't support pro-choice Republicans either. Well, let me and ask that's you hard. about that. That's hard. Let me ask you about the choice question. You're pro-choice. Right. Rich Williamson, the Republican who's running against... Uh, Carol Brown in yes. Illinois says he's pro-choice, although he was pro, he was anti-choice, he was, he was pro-life until about a week before he, uh, he announced. Put that aside. Your then party, why did you say it if you were putting it I wanted to put it on the table so that people <laughs> All right, understood. Then I'll comment about it. Your party's position, official yes. position is that there should be a constitutional amendment virtually banning abortion. My party's now, position why is should any woman why should any woman who feels strongly she's pro-choice and has money to give to races give to a party that is pro that is uh, against her on that when even if there's a man on the other side who happens to be pro-choice? World's longest question, but I'll still try for an answer. For the same reason that another woman who is a, believes in the Democratic Party, even though the governor of Pennsylvania, who's a Democrat, is pro-life, she would support that. Because but the women Democratic are right Party and there's no way, no, no, hey, I thought I get no to finish once that. in a while, Michael. Because it's a big tent, and I quote my county chairman, and I also quote my president, who puts a pro-choice woman in his cabinet because he knows he wants a mixture of views. And I believe that everybody does have a right to get to a decision on that and to publicly or privately have that belief. What have you done as a member of the president's cabinet to advance the pro-choice agenda which you say you support? I advance American men and women, and I will take a second seat to no one to advancing what I think is right for what America. 
have done and that or is choice. Only one of the issues. No one. That we what, 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 what harm well, is it to I President say, Bush's opposition to abortion? But he lets you sit well, in the first cabinet. First of all, I'm not going to have a vote on that. That's going to be the House and the Senate. It's going to be, in fact, Supreme Court. It's going to be, in fact. Uh, local legislators where my voting record was quite clear. And, and when we so come back, we'll talk a little bit about support uh, for women uh, in the legislature, yeah. and we'll ask our guests when we come back whether they agree that Barbara Bush is the most influential woman in politics in America today. <laughs> Crossfire is brought to you by GE. From plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. The Proctor National Bank is closed for the holiday. You have reached Lucci Plumbing. I am indisposed at the moment. Ever try to get help on a holiday or a weekend? It's nearly impossible. Unless you're calling one very special number. GE Answer Center may I help you. 24 hours a day, even holidays, GE's Answer Center is there. Whether you're thinking of buying a GE appliance or already own one. My son just put marbles in the ice maker. Don't worry, ma'am. The I GE Answer Center never closes. I've been thinking, the way our competitors do business, it's no wonder their computers cost so much. It's too bad you have to foot the bill. Bill Hayden, Chairman, CompuAd. Hello? 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 The way I see Hello? it, other computer companies Hello? respond to their customers Hello? as if they were Hello? hard of hearing. Excuse me! I rest my case. Bill Hayden, Chairman, CompuAd. Today, we need to make every drop of oil count. So at BP, we're using advanced drilling techniques. Building oil fields that are smaller, more efficient, more productive than ever. Because that's the kind of thinking it takes to deliver about 10% of America's domestic oil. And to make the most of every drop. BP, the energy to change. Of all denture adhesives, only one holds the strongest, and it's just taken a turn for the better. Fix it in its new easy twist cap. It's bigger, it's a snap to open, and it's one more reason to fix a dent and forget it. I will be a fighter in the United States Senate for a woman's right to choose. Yeah. Welcome back to Crossfire. Tonight we're discussing the influence of women in politics, 1992 style. Our guests are Secretary of Labor Lynn Martin, who was a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate in 1990, and Jane Danowitz, Executive Director of the Women's Campaign Fund. Uh, Jane Danowitz, when I was governor, the legislature in New Hampshire was at least one-third women in the House, over one-third women in the Senate. One of the complaints most of those women, Republican conservatives for the most part, had is they got ignored by the women's uh, political action committees all around the country. Why is that? Well, actually, the Women's Campaign Fund, uh, through our good, great Senator Susan McLean, who is, I think, a friend of yours, has put in a great deal of money into the campaign. How about the other 170 women that were involved in the process? They wouldn't pass yeah, your well, we don't, we don't, so we don't stand up for her for something. I actually... Not, they didn't support me some of the time, and yes, that, you know, you're a little bit bruised by that, but still they've supported a lot of women, until recently, and not just yours, Jane. Women's groups have had very little money to give to lots of candidates. One of the things I think that is more appropriate now is not just one particular group, but as we look at all of the candidates, we can look at a George Bush and we can say, okay, um, he's got you three women. That. No, I can't. I will. I'm going to say something nice about the president, which I think is long overdue. More women in the cabinet than ever before. We can look at a, at a Governor Clinton. Right. Now, wait. Let me let me finish because I'm going to be I'm actually going to be pleasant, reasonably pleasant about all that, three. So of you better be quick. Well, it's not that pleasant. <laughs> Uh, Governor Clinton, we've seen the list of five people that he's thinking about, supposedly a short list and for not one, not one woman, woman it's on it. With, when you think about Pat Schroeder, when you think about uh, uh, Barbara Kennelly, you when you think about Barbara you would McCall, support Pat lastly, Schroeder for vice president. No, I'm saying that I think women who so represent their party. No, that isn't hypocritical. I said very clearly, I think women Governor should Clinton be at should the support. top in both parties. And when you look at Ross Perot, who I'm sure is a very nice man. 
You look around him, every name. Has anybody even seen a name around him that's a woman? I do think that's a problem. No matter who is elected, I want President Bush to be elected. But no matter who's elected, do I want to see women because I think they represent some of the best talent in America? You bet. Let me, let me, uh, let me, let me ask you something maybe we can agree on, Lynn. Uh, there's a lot of sneering these days about feminism. John was sneering a little bit in the open about feminism. Wouldn't you agree with me that if it weren't for the women's movement, Republican and Democratic women who are now enjoying political success would not be enjoying it? I think that what's happened has as much to do with education, with change. I think there are parts of the women's movement that were helpful. I don't find that you have to uh, compartmentalize everything that's happened. A lot of things have, but there still is a problem. Uh, this show, a crossfire, no one thinks it's unusual if it's two men. It would still be thought unusual if it's two women. So I'm not saying we're there quite at no, the but, nirvana, but, but, but we're coming along. Liberals I, talk more about it, by the way, I can pick up on your point. You know, this is the year of the political woman, but one of the things, we talk about Hill Thomas and times of change and so forth, but we're succeeding in 1992 because we were, we've were we been working for decades to increase the yeah. number of women in the state legislatures and increase the number of women mayors and county commissioners. And, and we've been we've toiling, already, but we've been toiling in the vineyards for years. One our legislature has been women for decades in the state. But, but, it's, but, it's, but it's, well, I think that's because, that's that's because, ago, that's because John, you don't pay anything. John, John, and I were, John and I were talking before the show. And we, were, we, we, we agreed that if in the 60s some prominent politician had said, for example, I don't think politics is a proper role for women, right. it probably wouldn't have even made the newspaper. Absolutely now true. they would be driven from office in two seconds. Be normal. No, now they say isn't it that, isn't I'm that afraid. the women's movement, isn't that feminism that deserves a great deal of credit for that? How about if we say it's women that deserve a great deal of credit for it and intelligent men? Because if we're not in Getting this together, it's running. not going to work. They one can't get elected if one they don't more run. thing that I suspect that we they're might all agree with. And they're willing to and run. That is Why are they willing to run? It's because women's roles have changed. People's sure, ideas, men and they women's want ideas. They influence policy and they're doing a good job right. of it. And they, Rutgers, and they in have fact, the education, said that. And they're moving ahead and they have the but potential. But isn't that all because and of the women's movement? And because, bluntly, the House and Senate Thank looks, you, Jane. looks <laughs> partially. But I said it's a lot of things. You, you know, you want to give credit to individuals. It's also because of people that preceded me that did some long, lonely things as women, and I owe Jane, them. You, and you I think, that, I think that's one of the problems. I mean, I think you, you've 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 hit the nail on the head, and that I think that's one of the See, reasons like where, that. that we're seeing not so many Republican women because there isn't that kind of networking and support. Women need help from other women. No one asks us to run for office. We have to do it ourselves. I have. Do you feel uh, what I'm saying, when a, a conservative Republican come gets elected, from a lot if of she's women. a woman, well, do you feel that that's a defeat if a conservative Republican woman gets elected? Is how, that something that you feel? It depends how you, you define un conservative. I don't. I, we don't. She's we don't. Not pro -choice. Choice. We don't. Su we, don't pro -choice. we don't support a, a candidate. So, for example, who the senator mentioned in his article, uh, Charlene Har, who's running against. Uh, um, Tom Daschle, who, 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 who defeated who, your candidate, who, who is who is not only anti-choice but doesn't support the civil rights bill, a bill which the president so you, himself you would say signed. For your group, you're only going to support some women, and even if they follow your agenda all the time, well, you may not necessarily frankly, support a, them against Frankly, there's a lot men. of conversation about what conservative women. You but have a right just, to do They're that, just not out know, there. I mean, we, we talk about this unusual. group, right. this group of candidates that just doesn't exist. Let's take a break. Well, we're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit about the role of. Anita Hill in the forthcoming election. Next time.
time you wonder if this country has what it takes to compete in tough, demanding world markets, stop by one of our hometowns. No matter where you live or close by, over 2 million people in 48 states helping make the Boeing Company America's largest exporter. On a 10-minute call to England, MCI now saves you 53% over AT&T's basic rates. To Hong Kong, MCI saves you 61%. To Germany, 58%. Introducing friends around the world, the lowest-priced international call you can make. Just pick that special person in one of over 200 places. Save 26% on a 10-minute call to Argentina, 58% to Israel. Call MCI now, before you make another call. Lynn Martin, you're from Illinois and you mm -hmm. know Illinois politics. Is the conventional wisdom completely wrong that one reason Carol Braun upset Alan Dixon was that people, men and women, but especially women, were mad at him over Anita Hill? Oh, I, you know, I, you're going to find a lot of reasons. I think more conventional wisdom that's accurate is somebody else spent five million dollars sort of banging around him and Carol was a very attractive good candidate and that shouldn't be diminished. It was a three-way race. Those always are interesting and primaries are unusual. I mean both parties and primaries tend to be uh, rather than just totally in the middle more conservative for con Republicans, more liberal for Jay. Yeah, yeah, is, 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 is the, uh, is the uh, Anita Hill uh, issue going to be a powerful one for women candidates? Absolutely and I mean I think I think you can take a look at Lynn Yagel's victory in Pennsylvania, Diane Feinstein, Barbara Boxer's victories in California to see that Carol Mosey Braun's victory wasn't a fluke. Oh, and this no is, one and this was is not a, this that is not change. a friend. We just said there were lots of women. This is not a friend. But the all of these, position, all, of, Hill all of these women have campaigned overtly on the Hill Thomas hearings, and all of these women have received significant support mm -hmm. from women voters based on their uh, anger over those hearings and based on the fact they want to be at the table. I think some of that anger is quite justified and I supported Clarence Thomas. I think you could support Clarence Thomas and still look around at that Absolutely. all male body and say, wait a minute, just the way this is being handled is why, not Why does it cut that way if more women still believe that Clarence Thomas was, was saying you the know, right thing like and not Anita Hill? That's, that's didn't a, like the Senate, John. That's, that's an, over, you know, an overnight poll. The bottom line is all those women, women who watched those hearings, whether they supported Anita or Clarence, took a look at that Senate, saw 14 white men, mm -hmm. didn't like what they saw, didn't like the result of those hearings, and decided to take action well, and go to the polls my and support women candidates. Is I would say that it is going to be one issue, and some people, some women, like the result, but still didn't like the way you get there across no, party I think not about the press. Is the press helping feed that? Is the press decided sure. what side they want to be on? Frankly, they the, being frankly, part of the this press definition? in the beginning have been the biggest skeptics. I can't tell you how many reporters that you had to explain to them about the impact of Hill Thomas, and they couldn't believe it until we had Carol Mosley well, Brown's victory. You couldn't believe it until you saw Lynn, Yagle's yeah. victory, and so on and so yeah. forth. Um, and, and the press likes easy, quick answers. And the other thing, no, no but on no. this one, no, no, wait. Not this press. The press <laughs> also, um, I think, uh, starts feeling Make guilty. Quick, <laughs> all I'm saying, I'm going to give a compliment to CNN. I think it's appalling that we will listen to handlers all day and night, but that networks won't carry the President of the United States or the Democratic nominee more often. My compliments all to right. us, CNN. On that high-minded note, thank you, Lynn Martin. Thank you, Jane Danowitz. Thank you. Two white males will be back in just a moment. <laughs> Not for long. He's locked up the Democratic nomination. Now the main event, and Bill Clinton faces the political fight of his life. Governor Bill Clinton takes your phone calls tonight. Larry King Live, 9 Eastern, on CNN. This is the biggest oven I've ever seen. Introducing a GE gas oven with sealed burners and 30% more oven space, all in the same kitchen space. The new XL44 from GE. You made too much food. Muriel, you're a pain in the... It's the big oven everyone's talking about. I swim. I jog. I love junk food. Sometimes even I get constipation. When it happens to me, I take this little pill. It's X-Lax. 
surprised? Now, only X-Lax pills give you three choices. Regular, extra gentle, or new maximum relief with 50% more medicine. Today's X-Lax, for regular people who sometimes aren't. I'll have a Big Mac and small fries. Oh. You get the same thing every time. They have chef salad, filet of fish, chicken fajitas. Come on, live a little. Okay, I'll have a Big Mac and large fries. You're a wild man. Now on video cassette, it's the Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. Join Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, the Scarecrow. Get two dollars off the fully animated Wizard of Oz wherever you buy Klondike ice cream bars. For a transcript, send four dollars to Crossfire Transcripts, Journal Graphics Incorporated, 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203, or call 303-831-9000. Pat Buchanan announced today to everyone's surprise that he's undergoing elective heart surgery tomorrow. And everyone on Crossfire, and I'm sure every viewer of Crossfire, even though they disagree with him on many things, wishes Pat the best. We do wish you the best, Pat, but I didn't even know you had a heart. <laughs> Michael, one of the things about these women's groups is that they decide more on issue rather than just supporting women. When you take a look at the women they've been supporting, they're not Republicans, they're not conservatives, and they don't happen to correspond to one narrow list. But I test. put it to you, John, surely that is exactly what the principle should be. You support people because of what they stand for, you support them on their merit. You don't want people to support support people simply because of their race or their sex, do you? That only violates only every... if they claim, only if they claim that's their they purpose claim, in life. They, they believe in women's in life, issues. And they, they claim their purpose in life is to support women. They should have supported Christy Whitman uh, against uh, Bradley last time, and they ought to be supporting some more Republican women. Why can't they decide, to... as, 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 uh, as they apparently have, that they want to support women who are pro-choice, because they regard that as an important issue for women. There are lots of Republican women that fit that category. They've chosen not to support them. Because they know the Republican Party is not pro-choice, and that's a box you guys are stuck in for a long time. Then they ought to put Democrat in the label of the organization, because that's all they are, is a front for the ultra-liberal Democratic oh. Party. <laughs> from the left, I'm Mike Kinsley. Good night for Crossfire. And from the right, I'm John Sununu. Join us again tomorrow night for another edition of Crossfire. The President's press conference is up next, and here's Bernie Shaw to introduce us to it. Thank you, Michael. Coming up in just a couple of minutes, President Bush is set to hold his first primetime news conference in more than three years. We'll also talk to Tom Luce, campaign chairman for Ross Perot. Stay with CNN. an old paper girl to keep things going? Always have. Smart people plan for success early, and they choose a smart bank. First Star, where the people are Main Street friendly, and the advice is Wall Street smart. Clark Thompson Furniture has done it again. They've rolled back the prices to the lowest in years, and all with two years of free interest. Truckloads of furniture arrive daily at Clark Thompson's. Beautiful, quality, famous, name brand furniture. And they've rolled back the prices like you haven't seen in a long, long time. And everything in the store can be financed for two full years with absolutely no interest. 24 months, interest free. For the best furniture buys and the best selection, hurry to Clark Thompson Furniture, East University in Hubble, today. Presenting Digital Music Express. <laughs> 30 channels of CD quality music, 24 hours a day, no interruptions, no talk, and if you like rock and roll, you'll love DMX, 
We've got 24-hour channels for classic rock, folk rock, album rock, two oldies channels, the heavy metal channel, and one just for alternative rock. Want DMX? Here's how to get it. DMX comes through your TV cable, into your DMX tuner, right into your stereo. And you get all 30 channels for a lot less than you thought you'd ever pay for music. Digital Music Express. Just call us today. This is CNN. This is CNN Breaking News. As president, George Bush likes this house, wants another four-year lease. But his campaign message is being jammed by, among other things, the Ross Perot bandwagon. I'm Bernard Shaw in Washington. To break out and get more attention, Mr. Bush has called the news conference. Because the three broadcast networks suspect this will be more political than presidential, they are refusing to carry it, period. Our public opinion analyst, Bill Schneider, now. Bill, what's in play here? Well, Bernie, this is a remarkable event. The President of the United States is trying to get news coverage, and he can't. President Bush is doing the same thing that Bill Clinton did when he went on the Arsenio Hall show last night. He's trying to get some attention. No one seems to be interested in Bush or Clinton. Maybe the President of the United States isn't important enough. After all, he's not Ross Perot. Has the President or the White House created a problem? Well, I think they, they have in a way because they built up expectations. There's been bad news for the last couple of days, the defection of advisors, this possible shakeup in the staff. They're trying to recycle the news now to get some good coverage of the president. Well, let's go into the East Room now where the White House press corps has assembled to await President Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Well, I have a brief statement, and then I'll be glad to take questions. Two months ago, I asked the Congress to cut almost $8 billion in wasteful spending projects. And tonight, I've just signed the cuts that Congress sent to me in response. It's not all that I asked for, but it's a good start. $8 billion sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But the facts remain. It isn't good enough, not by a long shot. The American people know budget deficits deficits threaten the uh, long-term economic health of our country. And over the years, we've accumulated federal debt totaling $65,000 for every family of four in America. This debt does not create more wealth. It merely helps pay for our current consumption. And it reminds me of the old fellow who bragged to his family that he'd finally borrowed enough money uh, to pay off his debts. Our political system as it is now, has failed to meet its responsibility to address this problem. And in the face of several hundred billion dollar budget deficit, a piecemeal approach simply will not do the job. Uh, we need a constitutional amendment to balance the federal budget, and we need it now. Three years ago, in my first address to the Congress, I asked the Senate and the House to pass such an amendment. And every year since then, I have repeated a call. Like President Reagan before me, I've tried to get Congress to act responsibly and to restrain the growth of federal spending. Uh, we've tried compromise. Uh, we've tried confrontation. We've tried quiet diplomacy with the congressional leaders. And none of this is, has been enough. And tonight, I am more convinced than ever that a balanced budget amendment is the only way to force the federal government, both the Congress and the executive branch, to live within its means. This month, both houses of Congress will vote on a balanced budget amendment. It is impossible to underestimate the importance of this one decision. It will affect every other decision that the government makes from that moment on, and it will de bear directly on the quality of life that we leave the generations who follow us. Victory will not come easily. The amendment requires a two-thirds majority from both the Senate and the House. And I'm pleased to say that many serious-minded members, Republicans and Democrats alike, support this measure. They understand that this is not a partisan fight. It goes far beyond election year politics. It is a fight for the economic security of the American people. 
I realize that some in Washington consider a balanced budget amendment uh, a rather radical step. Well, I strongly doubt that the American people uh, consider a balanced budget amendment as radical. It's common sense, pure and simple. Each month, millions of American families sit down to balance their checkbooks. 44 states, 44 states have their own constitutional balanced budget requirements and the federal government must now do the same. The moment is at hand. Uh, in the coming days, we will face an extraordinary choice. We can choose either to accept the status quo, piling debt upon debt, or we can strike a bold new course, restoring fiscal sanity to the federal government. And if we choose wrong, if we choose wrongly, uh, our grandchildren and their grandchildren are gonna bear the burden. I refuse to believe that we will make them pay the price for Washington's irresponsibility. And for their sake, I urge every congressman and every senator to join me in supporting the swift approval of a balanced budget amendment. Now I will be glad to respond to questions. I think, Terry, I think you have the first. Mr. President, I'd like to ask you about Ross Perot. He complained that you're hiding and you're afraid to take him on directly. Will you commit yourself to debating Mr. Perot as well as Bill Clinton in the fall campaign? I'm sure there will be debates, and uh, I will be ready to join the fray after the conventions. But as you know, uh, I have not challenged uh, directly either uh, Perot or Clinton, Mr. Perot or Governor Clinton. I have no intention of changing that uh, before the convention. I am trying to get things done that will help this country. The balanced budget amendment is a good example of that. And if I get too caught up in the political wars at this time, it'll be even more difficult to get things through the Congress that will help a crime bill, an education bill, balanced budget amendment, things that we really need. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep on this course that I've been on. Uh, I've, I've been faithful to it during the uh, primary season and I will continue to be until I make a decision to change. Helen? I mean, in the fall campaign, I'm not talking about immediately right now, but will you commit yourself to debating the two, two men? There will be debates. President, uh, granting the uh, legality, is it proper for a man, uh, for a candidate with vast personal wealth to, uh, and no spending limits to use that to attain the presidency? And since you've known Mr. Perot for so long, is he an insider, an outsider? Is he a man of principle? Helen. Or does he go for the main chance? Yeah. Um, I'd love to answer that question, and after the con because I've vowed to keep my sights set on these legislative goals and on leading this country. And if I get into characterizing one opponent or another, uh, I diminish my effectiveness in doing that. We've got a good chance now, and some of it's brought about by the, by the primaries, I think, to pass this balanced budget amendment, for example. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that our education reform bill is languishing up there. Uh, I'd like to see us get a good energy bill soon, but if I start concentrating on the politics, I'm afraid I will waste an opportunity. I think we're in a real opportunity situation now. Do you think he's trying to buy the president? Well, so far not. We'll wait and see. Charles. Mr. President, you've often said that you've not done so terrific a job of getting your message across. Tonight you've changed the venue. But uh, I wanted to ask you if it, indeed what you've seen in the polls and the constant uh, uh, one-third or more of, of the electorate that's going other ways uh, isn't uh, a rejection of that message in and of itself. I don't think so, because you ask... Uh, in these deadly polls that I read all the time, uh, you know, about issue relating to issues, and it's, it's, it's vague out there. I'm, we've got a good program, and tonight maybe this is a more effective way to say we want a balanced budget amendment. We got a good program on the Hill to achieve a balanced budget amendment, or after the balanced budget amendment is, is passed to achieve a balanced budget. And so I... I think we just got to keep hammering away on the issues because I believe the American people are with me. If they understand our total reform of education, they'll support it. Most Americans want a tougher crime bill. I heard people out on the West Coast who don't vote for tougher crime legislation all advertising in those 90-second bites they paid for ads how tough they are on crime. Maybe we've got a better chance now to pass an administration crime bill. So I'm gonna keep focusing on those issues and hopefully the American people will say, 
He has a sound program for domestic affairs, just as he does in foreign relations. But if, if I could follow, sir, hasn't the pattern through the primaries uh, been such that the American people have been constantly looking for an alternative? You may have yes. put Pat Buchanan behind, but now you've got Ross Perot. Is he the inheritor of that? No, well, I don't think so. I'll tell you what, I, I think um, most people would concede that, that my problems stem from this sluggish, anemic economy. I think you can trace that, uh, those problems to getting bigger with that. Now, I think the economy is improving. We still have some big problems there. For a person that's out of work, that, for him, that unemployment is 100%. For a woman that can't get a job that wants one, for her, unemployment is 100%. So we've got to keep pushing ahead, and I would make the appeal right now for our growth incentives to stimulate, further stimulate an economy that is beginning to move and is beginning to move positively. But uh, no, I think, it's, I think my fortunes have been related to that, and I think if I'll take the blame, some of which I'll take is the uh, economy has been sick. Uh, I, I assume the American people are fair enough to get credit uh, when there's recovery. Yeah. Uh, the, your spokesman today described Mr. Perot as a man whose entire history is to stomp into the group, demand to do things his way, and if he doesn't get it, to pick up his football and go home. The vice president the other day questioned his judgment, saying he had been wrong on your most important decision of the presidency, the Persian Gulf War. Do you share their assessment? Uh, I'm glad that they are putting their focus on uh, these problems, but I'm not going to do it myself. Uh, I, I have a difference, clearly, as far as the Persian Gulf War goes, no question. And I think the American people support the actions that I took. Uh, I believe it was correct. I believe we performed well. I believe we set back aggression. I believe there was a whole new pride in this country. The international community supported it overwhelmingly. So as people point these things out, that's fair. And as his, his supporters uh, point out what they think might be foibles in me, that's fair too. So, but I'm going to stay on the path that I've outlined. Yes, ma'am. Mr. President, the amendment you're talking about would require a balanced budget within two years. If you're reelected, will you submit a balanced fiscal 1994 budget, whether or not you're required to? required to by constitutional amendment? It won't be. We, of course, we have submitted a balance, but it won't be in two years. And we have submitted budgets that get in it. We got one right up there now that does that. And it, I think it's going to be five years. Yeah, Brent. Mr. President, and then, uh, if the experience of your EPA chief uh, in Rio uh, to date is any uh, indication, uh, there's quite a reception committee of harsh critics of this administration and of you, sir, waiting for you down there. Under the circumstances, if that's what the reception is going to be in Rio, why go? Well, because we've got a sound and sensible environmental record, and we have a strong role of international leadership. I wonder if the American taxpayer knows that we have spent something like $800 billion in the last 10 years on cleaning up things, the atmosphere and environment in many, many ways. It is estimated that it'll be $1.2 trillion spent for the United States uh, taxpayers and businesses uh, over the next 10 years. We have a superb record to take to that, to that convention. I am not going to go down there and forget about people that need jobs in the United States of America. I'm going to take a strong record, the leading record on science and technology, the leading record on oceans, the leading record on forest, the leading records on uh, protecting the elephant, the leading records on CFCs. We got a good record. But because I will not sign a treaty that, in my view, throws too many Americans out of work, I refuse to accept that kind of criticism from what I consider some of the extremes in the envir environmental movement internationally or domestically. So we got a good record to take there, Britt, and I want to go down there. We're passing out booklets and little CDs, you know, little discs to show everything. I was out at Goddard the other day. The science that we have that can help the third world is mind-boggling. We want to share it with these people, but I want to keep this country growing, and I want to see us have the cleanest, best record in the world. And besides that, we have a Clean Air Act that we can, others ought to take a look at and say, you've done wonders in getting what you did through President Bush. And so I'm going to go on the offense, not defense. Well, I just wonder, sir, clearly the, uh, many of those who were there are aware of the elements of your record. 
and have come to the conclusions which they so vocally uh, express anyway. How do you think this can be a plus for you, Dan? Well, I, hey, listen, I'm used to a little criticism. I want to go on the offense and say what we've done and what we're prepared to do. And uh, I wouldn't go along with the extremes uh, in many of these international negotiations, but I have some responsibility. Responsibility for a cleaner environment and also responsibility to families in this country who want to work, some of whom can be thrown out of work if we go for too costly an answer to some of these problems. And I'm not going to forget the American family. And if they don't understand it in Rio, too bad. I don't, I'm not going to be driven, though, Britt, by the extremes of these movements. They started protesting before they even know what our position was. But I'm going there and take this record, and, and uh, I'm convinced that it'll be very productive. Yeah. And now, oh, Ellen, I said Ellen, and then Jane. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, you say your problems at the, uh, in the primaries have been caused largely by the anemic economy. Yet the economy is improving, and the voters seem to be walking away from you in droves, sir. Um, don't you take it personally, and what are you going to do about it? I don't, I don't take it personally. And as a guy that never looks at polls, as you know, I would like to cite a poll figure for you. Seventy percent of the people in the most recent poll I saw that was done for our campaign said that they thought the economy was getting worse. And uh, the, economy is, uh, the economy is moving. There's still some problems. As I say, when a person's hurting for a job, that worries me. But G uh, gross, uh, gross domestic product, GNP, is moving. Uh, industrial production is up. Uh, payroll employment is up. And another thing that's up, and then soon will be picked up on the, these broad polls, is that Michigan survey on business confidence. So things are turning around, and yet at this juncture, the American people haven't felt it. When they do, I think you'll, I expect to see some change. But no, I don't take it personally at all. I honestly don't, Alan. Aren't the American people... We've been, I've been in tough times before. Well, well, sir, aren't the American people uh, right in holding you personally responsible for the, the problems of this country? Well, I think they hold me responsible to some degree, and I think they hold the United States Congress responsible. I would remind the people that Congress appropriates every dime uh, and tells me how to spend every dime. It's the Congress that does that. But sure, I'll accept my share of the responsibility for this long recession, uh, and so will the Congress. But the question isn't blame. The question is what you do about it. And I've proposed tonight, let's move on the balanced budget amendment. Let's move on my growth initiatives that would stimulate investment, like cutting the capital gains, moving on the investment, uh, uh, investment allowance that speeds up depreciation, first time uh, home credit, uh, uh, credit for home buyers. This is all good and valuable uh, stuff that would speed this economy up. And so I, I don't think it's a question of blame. It's a question of staying in this non-political mode for a while longer, challenging the Congress to help us help the American people. Well, well sir, the Congress hasn't passed all these programs you talked about. So, it's not so too late. They ought to try now. Well, so why don't you tell us what you really think about Ross Perot? <laughs> What's that have to do with it? Come on. Sir, you say that you have a strong international leadership role, but uh, in the new world order that you are promoting is being challenged in Yugoslavia these days. Uh, it appears that the sanctions are not working against Serbia. When are you going to take the lead of an international coalition to, uh, to force Milosevic out of Bosnia the way you did with Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait? I think the sanctions, I'm not prepared to give up on the sanctions at all. They've only been in effect for a few days. And uh, as you know, first on this question of Yugoslavia, out in front, was the United Nations. You had uh, Cyrus Vance, as a representative of the United Nations, did a superb job trying to negotiate, ably implemented, supplemented, I might say, by Peter Carrington. They tried to work that problem, uh, had our full support. The EC, which is right there in the neighborhood, uh, tried to have an effective role. It now appears that a U.S. role, catalytic role, uh, is important. And thus, we are moving forward. Secretary Baker made a very strong statement on this recently. Has worked closely with the leaders of Europe, and so we are united in this sanctions question. And let's see if it works. But I'm not prepared to say these sanctions will not work. Is the, the fact that the elections are approaching in the U.S. preventing a military action? I think prudence and caution presents military act, prevents military actions. If I decide to change my mind on that, I will do it in a uh, in an inclusive way. 
But I, at this juncture, I'm, I want to stay with these uh, sanctions. Yeah. No, wait a minute. Here, Jane, I'm sorry. I recognized them and did not follow through. Mr. President, your budget director yesterday laid out a number of ways of bringing the deficit under control, even without a balanced budget amendment. But all of them would require taking on tough pressure groups. You have not often seemed to use the bully pulpit of the presidency to do that, uh, to, to take a direct head-on approach. Why not? We've got the program up there. There are some 30 pages of options. Uh, we are not, you don't have to touch Social Security to do this, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, we have made growth assumptions in there that can be easily met. Four, four, three, two, three, two, three, two. Those are the percentages of growth. Can easily be met if we move with partial uh, uh, growth agenda that I've proposed. So I will keep repeating as I did in the State of the Use Union message, as I did subsequently right here in this room, get the Congress to pass this growth agenda. But that's what's needed, plus some direct controls of spending. And you can do it by controlling the growth of these spending programs, leave out Social Security, to the rate of inflation and population increase. And it's not a gimmick. It works. It's not rosy scenario. It works. That is my detailed proposal. I'd like to see some other detailed proposals, but that is a good one. It's sitting up there right now. And it won't be done if we don't control the growth of mandatory programs. That's where, what, two-thirds or uh, close to three-fourths of the budget is. Limits on mandatory programs would involve pain and sacrifice, and yet neither you nor Mr. Perot nor Mr. Clinton talks about that. Has presidential politics become so soundbite-driven that it's politically suicidal to, to level with the American? I don't think it's suicidal, and I think our program up there that gives many suggestions as to how to achieve this is good. And yes, it's not easy. Medicare, Medicaid growth is going through the roof. And yes, we're going to have to find ways to control it. But what we've done is detail the areas that need to be controlled. And I think that is a sensible, sound, detailed program. Kathy, now I had this go. Go, Kathy, and then here, and then on the aisle. Mr. President. Oh, wait, wait, forget. You're, no, you're fourth. A fair amount has been written about Ross Perot's role with the Reagan administration on the POW MIA issue, and it relates directly to you. If one news report's correct, he's going to testify on the subject soon. What, you said you won't characterize him, but can't you tell us what your dealings were with him on this issue? Uh, I, I will uh, be prepared to uh, uh, elaborate on that later on. My dealings were, I was a member of the Reagan administration uh, for a while. He was over being quite helpful, trying to do something about the, uh, about the prisoners. What happened beyond that? I saw a detailed story today that I simply cannot comment on. Uh, we are on, uh, uh, Marlon Fitzwater, then the press secretary for uh, President Reagan, is on the record at a, at a public press conference commenting on the, po the uh, parole roll, so I would refer you to that. That was back in, I believe, in 87, uh, and uh, I'd rather leave it right there. But uh, if, if he's going to explain this to the Congress, that, that's, that's good. I hadn't heard that. Mr. President, in the interest of party unity, and since he has indicated that he is going to endorse you at the Houston Convention, do you, would you like uh, Pat Buchanan to have the primetime speech that he wants to have at the Republican Convention in August? Susan, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I haven't focused on that at all. Uh, I welcome the support of all Republicans, and uh, let's see how he ha handles this, and let the, let the people handling the convention work it out. That is not on my agenda. Do you think his uh, primary challenge was damaging to you or helpful or what? Well, I can't say it was particularly helpful, but uh, he got into a long line of people criticizing me, five on the Democratic side and one there. And uh, But maybe I'm a little stronger for it. Maybe I'm a little better, better uh, be a little better candidate when it comes to the fall. I did not engage with Pat Buchanan. I don't plan to do that now. But... Uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll grope around to see if I can think of some reason it's helpful, but I, I, uh, I, but I have no hard feelings about that at all. Yeah, right here. Mr. President, critics of yours on Capitol Hill have said your policies towards Saddam Hussein before the Gulf War strengthened him and made him more likely to make an attack against one of his neighbors. How do you respond to that? I've got a follow-up. Yeah, uh, I respond that that's not right. Uh, as I said at my last, last press conference, we tried. 
not through strengthening his nuclear or biological or chemical weapons has been alleged, not by giving him part of Kuwait has been alleged, but we tried to work with him on grain credits and things of this nature to avoid aggressive action. And it failed. It failed. That approach, holding out a hand, trying to get him to renounce terrorism and join the family of nations, didn't work. And the minute he moved aggressively, uh, we moved aggressively and set back aggression. You got a lot of people that opposed what happened on the war, stood there and didn't want to move, that are now trying to revise history. And so I am not uh, persuaded by the, by the critics at all. I know what we did. There wasn't anything illegal. We tried hard and I've said so, and it didn't work. But we were not gonna let aggression stand. And when he moved into Kuwait, I decided this will not stand, and it didn't. Yeah, what's the follow-up? The follow-up is that the House Judiciary Committee looks like they're going to recommend a special prosecutor independent counsel to investigate and ask the Attorney General... To I wonder whether they're going to use the same prosecutors that are trying out there to see whether I was in Paris in 1980 and flew home in an SR-71 Blackbird. I mean, where are we going with the taxpayers' money in this political year? So uh, let them look at it. It's no problem to me, but uh, I, I think at some point... Somebody ought to say, where is all this money going that goes to pay for these special prosecutors rummaging through files and proving nothing? I was not in Paris, and we did nothing illegal or wrong here. We tried, and it didn't work, and we moved, and that's the answer to it. Yeah, Jesse. Mr. President, uh, since you know oh, Ross Perot, if you were to run into him while you're out campaigning, for re-election, for example, what would you say to him to convince him to um, support, support you and give up his quest for the presidency? What would you say? Uh, well, I'd say, Ross, I, I think I've been a good president. Uh, I believe that uh, a man of your ability and talent ought to support me, and uh, we've known each other a long time. In my view, it's been favorable. And uh, just leave it there. I, I would admit I'd be might be a little bit of a long shot in persuading him. But, but if he said, "Well, George, I I uh, I hear what you're saying. You want me to follow you, but you got to tell me where you're going." What would you say? Oh, I'd say good. Let me let me refresh you on our domestic agenda. Please give me your support for the balanced budget amendment that we're trying to pass right now, and bring along Bill Clinton if you got any influence on it. We're talking about issues here. We got a tough crime bill before the Congress. Help me pass it. We've got an education reform bill that literally revolutionizes education. Give me a hand with this one. If you know anybody in the Congress, appears you may, give them a call. And I'd, 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 I'd take this approach, you see, to him. And I'd try to enlist his help on, on support for our pro approach to the environment. Uh, I'd say help me uh, help these democratic countries around the world. Uh, help me help, help them secure their democracy. And I, you see, I think we have a good agenda. And, and I, 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 that's the approach I'd take anyway. Yes, friend. Mr. President, you've spent much of your life as part of the two-party system. You've headed one of the major parties. In this unusual political year, well, how do you assess the viability of the two-party system in the future? And why would any candidate submit himself to grueling primaries if he could just announce and run? Uh, I think the two-party system has, has really given us the most stable political system in the world. And yes, we're going through an unusual period, but uh, the two-party system has provided us fantastic historical stability. And you look around the world and compare this system with any other democratic system, uh, and I think that would, that would avail. Uh, I'm sure the Brits take great, great pride in their uh, parliamentary system, but I think our two-party system has provided us with a stability that, that heretofore we've simply taken for granted. So my view is this campaign unfolds, as all of us spell out our position on the issues, people are going to recognize that, and, uh, and the two parties will be uh, strong when this election is over. And the question of why any candidate would would expose himself to the primaries and that's what and Barbara was asking me a few minutes ago. What's your answer? Say, hey, I want to continue this job to help this country. I want to preserve help preserve world peace and strengthen it. We've done pretty well there, and I want to move forward on these uh, issues that we're talking about here tonight: the balanced budget amendment and crime. Won't repeat them all, but uh, it, it's worth finishing the job. Nobody likes the primary process. I had a call from a senator kind of asking how I was holding up 
because he said, hey, you've been criticized a little in the newspapers and on the television. And I said, hey, that goes with the job. I'm, I'm, I'll do my best, and I think things are going to turn around in that regard. But to, to get out of the arena, to suggest that you're going to run because it's not particularly pleasant, that's not the way I operate. Yeah. Mr. Pre Mr. President, there are many polls that now show that uh, in California and elsewhere that most Republican, uh, Republicans favor um, pro-choice position on abortion. And I wonder, uh, in view of that and in view of the, the clear feeling of pro-choice in the party, that you feel the platform needs to be changed uh, and what your own view is on uh, the whole notion of uh, whether the abortion debate is going to be prominent in the fall. Well, no, I hope the platform committee, in their wisdom, adopts the same language as we had before. Having said that, there is room in our party for people that have different views on this issue. Uh, I am not persuaded that people all across this country vote on only one issue, abortion. I think they're interested in world peace. I think they're interested in education. I think they happen to be very supportive of a balanced budget amendment. And so I, uh, my position is well known, and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to stay with it. But as I say, we've got many good Republicans who disagree with me on that issue, and they may disagree with me on uh, the balanced budget amendment or some of these other things I feel very passionately about. Jim. Um, you mentioned uh, a moment ago the polls, uh, the 70 percent figure about the economy. But, uh, you know, the Cold War is over, uh, Desert Storm has become pretty much a faded memory for many Americans, and people are turning inward and asking, well, Mr. President, what have you done for us lately? Uh, more than 80% of the American people now feel that the United States is on the wrong track. Uh, how, between now and November, are you going to convince Americans that they are better off than they were four years ago? Most Americans are fundamentally optimistic and they're going to see a recovering economy. May not be as robust as we all like, but they're going to say as they feel that and as they see uh, new opportunities and see a growth in this economy, uh, they're going to say, hey, things are getting better. Americans aren't pessimists. They're not down on the country. We've been through a long haul. And then they're going to, I'm going to say to them, hey, do your kids go to bed at night with more worry or less worry about nuclear war? I think that's a significant change. I think most every, fa every family in America is better off for those historic changes that uh, my predecessor and I helped bring about. I say use the word helped. And so you got to look at the whole picture. And then I think they're going to say, here's what the president's been trying to get through the Congress. And I come back to it, balanced budget amendment, strong crime, whatever it is, good record on the environment. And what's he up against here? And they're going to have a clear choice to make. And then they're going to say, does this president identify with my views on family? And does he share the, the leadership traits that I want to see in a leader? And those kinds of things. And those aren't in focus now. Uh, they're not in focus because five Democrats are out there just hammering away on the president of the United States. And I smile and say, look, uh, we'll, we'll meet you in the fall. And one Republican was doing the same thing every single night. Had some assistance out here from time to time from one or, one or the other in the room. And, uh, you know, I'm, sa I'm putting my confidence in the people saying we're going to get something done and take the case to the American people on the issues. And uh, that's the way I think you ought to do it. But, Mr. President, they aren't anywhere near that right now. And as a matter of fact, some of your advisors are pretty alarmed at the fact no, they're not that alarmed. While, while the economic figures are improving, your own poll numbers are on the decline. They are not associating you, sir, with any improvement in the economy. But 70% of the people, as I told you, Jim, according to one, I thought it was one of your surveys, seem to think the economy is getting worse. I think it's getting better. It takes a while. There's a lag there. Unemployment's a lagging indicator, for example. Uh, so it takes a while to see the change. And, it, and I haven't been in the playing field on the, on the primaries. I've been trying to get something done for the country. But when we go to the country and say, do you want a strong crime bill or do you want this watered down variety that's up in the Justice Department controlled by the Democrats that have been there forever? Do you want, which do you want? I think the American people will support me. I'll say to them, do you want a balanced budget amendment that will make the executive branch and the legislative branch do something about the deficits? Or do you want a lot of reasons from some entrenched politicians on Capitol Hill to tell you why it can't be done? 
And see, I think when that is in focus, I think that the American people will, will support me. I've tried to keep the faith with the people, and I think one heartening point is people see the president as, as a strong leader. They may not like the direction things are going in, but that is something that I find rather comforting. So you haven't yeah. been tough enough? Is that what you're saying? I haven't been. I, have, I need your assistance, Jim, in getting out the message now tonight loud and clear on what the president said about the balanced budget amendment, and if you can be an editor tutorial or two on there saying this is a good idea, it would help enormously. I don't think you can do that, but if you could, I'd welcome that kind of support because that's what the American people want, and we've got to get that message to the Congress. Yeah. Mr. President, you said that uh, your problems stem from the economy. Uh, are, in addition, are some of your problems also related to the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearing? None. We forget. Now we see a revision. We forget that the American people overwhelmingly supported Clarence Thomas. He is being a good justice, and the fact that some candidates are out there trying to uh, revise that part of history, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't agree with that. There may be some. Now, I can't say some people don't agree, that, you know, that everyone agrees with what I've said. I support Clarence Thomas. I think he'll be an outstanding justice. He passed a Senate that is controlled by the opposition party. He conducted himself with honor in those hearings, and that's my position. And I'm proud to have stayed with him when the going got tough. Yeah. yeah Mr. President, you say that the leadership qualities that are going to come out later are not in focus right now. But it would seem that leadership is the focus, that Ross, that's the only thing that Ross Perot has been running on, is leadership. Uh, he has not addressed the issues. You are addressing the issues. How do you feel? What do you say to Republicans who are going over and supporting him about your personal leadership quality? I say, take a look at what happened in Desert Storm, where I didn't have to get anybody else's action. I moved. I saw a threat. I did what was required. And I didn't have to get a Congress controlled by the opposition party to move. The people saw leadership and action there. The people know that the House of Representatives and the Senate control all the legislation. My crime bill, my balanced budget quest, whatever it is, they control it all. And so I think when this campaign gets really rolling, and it hadn't started from our standpoint, uh, when that happens, I think these things will be in focus. So I understand the quest for change and the appeal. I can bring you the new answer here. I can understand all that, but I also think the American people are pretty smart. I think they're going to look at the overall record. I think they're going to analyze the proposals. I think they're going to look at a person's overall values. And I think, I think then I have the confidence that it won't be just the Republicans that'll be supporting me. It'll be in a guy in the neighborhood who's wondering, is this, who's going to be the best to take care of the criminal elements here? Who's going to support the incentives to improve the economy? That's what I think. Mr. President, aren't we into a no-win situation here? Because even if you do win, even if you do defeat Ross Perot, there are going to be a lot of Republicans out there who supported him, and there's going to be a lot of reprisal and revenge. There's no reprisals. Look, America, says, Helen says we're through here, but let me tell you something. You're, you're looking at it, you're, you're dealing in a little cocoon here. We're talking about something big, faith and confidence in the American people. And this isn't done because there's some, something on the horizon right now and people are going to, uh, you know, let them decide. Let them, let them sort out this. And I can understand that appeal. I'm from outside. I'll solve all the problems. And someday you guys are going to start. How are you going to do it? How are you going to get this through the Congress? How, what do you believe? Do you think the president's right on the balanced budget amendment? Are you with him or against him? think he's right as he tries to tighten down on crime legislation. How do you feel on the narcotic problem? How do you feel on world peace? Were you with him when, the, when he had to make a very tough call on sen sending back aggression, a, a move that was saluted all over the entire world and put this country together like it's never been together in the past since World War II? And you see, I think, I think we're dealing in a funny time here, time warp. And I think come fall, when we're out there, taking our case to the people with an improved economy behind us, uh, I, I, I still feel confident about the outcome of the uh, political election. And I feel confident about ability to heal any wounds that may have been opened along the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Helen. Well, President Bush has concluded the news conference he wanted to have. He was denied nationwide exposure on the three broadcast networks because the networks 
thought that it might be more of a political than a presidential appearance. Our presidential, or rather our political analyst, uh, Bill Schneider, is with us here. Bill, what did you make of this? Well, this was a frustrated President Bush, and he clearly showed his frustration. He tried to lay out his program. I think what the President was trying to do was to say, I've got a program, it's a good one, but I'm frustrated, Congress won't pass it. He indicated that he was frustrated. He said 70% of Americans say the economy is getting worse. He said he assumes that people are fair enough to give him credit when they see that things are improving, but they don't see that yet. What he's trying to do is make the case, I've, I'm a leader, I've got a program, uh, you have to understand that. Why won't people support it? Why aren't the people behind me? That's the biggest question right now in this political year. The economy does seem to be improving a bit, uh, and I think there's some uh, evidence for economic optimism, yet it isn't helping President Bush's job ratings. It isn't helping him in this election. And one of the most interesting things about this entire news conference is almost half the questions dealt with Ross Perot. I heard Bill Clinton's name mentioned perhaps twice. Uh, Ross Perot's name was mentioned 15 or 20 times. In a sense, Ross Perot is setting the agenda here. After all, Ross Perot is the candidate who's trying to force the deficit into the center of the national debate, and the president responded to that tonight by forcefully calling for a balanced budget amendment. I heard Bush saying, essentially, I'm going to ignore Perot until after the conventions. That's right. The president said he was going to ignore Perot, but in the end, having gotten question after question, he said, we have to ask, he said to the press, you have to ask Ross Perot, how are you going to do it? How are you going to implement your program? Uh, what are your positions on a bunch of issues? He was trying to give cues to the press for how he'd like to see them handle Mr. Perot. Do you buy his saying, essentially, I'm too busy being president to play politics? <laughs> Everything the president does is politics. Clearly, his, his message is, I'm going to play politics by being president. And that's what people really want to see. They want to see some leadership. They want to see the president with an agenda and a program. That's the best thing he could possibly do to play politics in this election. Well, Ross Perot's campaign chairman was watching and listening to this news conference. When we come back, we will interview Tom Luce in Dallas. CNN's coverage of the President's News Conference is brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? Ask anyone who's driven a Ford lately. Like the people from Car and Driver, who'd named Taurus SHO one of their ten best. The people from Motor Trend, who named Explorer the best buy in its class. Or any one of the thousands of people who've made Escort the best-selling small car in America. Have you driven a Ford lately? It's more than just a question. It's an answer. Campaign Chairman Tom Luce joins us now from Dallas. Your impression of this news conference? Well, you know, I was struck by the fact of uh, how much this news conference and its uh, agenda and what was discussed was really driven by the millions of volunteers that have created this Perot phenomena, this Perot movement. You know, as Mr. Perot said about uh, three months ago, he talked about the crazy ant, uh, which was an analogy for the budget deficit and how nobody would bring it out of the basement and talk about it. Well, tonight, all of a sudden, it's leading the agenda, and I think that's a tribute to the millions of people who have worked to put Ross Perot on the ballot. What do you mean when you claim it is leading the agenda? How? Well, I think the millions of volunteers and what has happened about Ross Perot in the last three months have, have caused Washington, all of a sudden, to start talking about the budget deficit. You had last night senators talking about gee, we ought to talk about the budget deficit, and tonight we have the president talking about the budget deficit. And all that's driven by all this Perot phenomena that has been created and the movement that has been created by the millions of volunteers in the grassroots. Tom Luce, are you implying that there's not been any discussion in this capital about the budget deficit and balancing the budget before Perot? Oh, I, I wouldn't make that extreme a statement, Mr. Shaw, but I certainly would say that it certainly was not on the top of the agenda by driven by the fact that we have, a, proven by the fact we have a $400 billion deficit this year and we have a total deficit of what is it, a, a many trillions of dollars. How does it strike you that President Bush essentially said tonight he's going to ignore your man until after the conventions? Well, um, I think what's happening is is that this parole phenomena is really going to drive the agenda for the country. I think that you're going to see more discussion of 
of real issues in the campaign up ahead, and I think that's all for the good. I, I Again, that's a tribute to the volunteers and what they've created, and no telling what they can do in six more months. When is Ross Perot going to spell out to American voters where he stands on these issues you allude to? Well, you see, I think what's captured the imagination of the American people is what Ross Perot is, and that's leadership. That's a person who all of his life has made things happen, who has solved problems, as he says, is a person who's gotten under the hood and started fixing the car. I mean, you look at his track record in the public arena. He's demonstrated over and over an ability to build a consensus, exert leadership. I think that's uh, the main issue that the American people are grappling with. You know, if you go back and look at the 17-point programs or the 14-point programs of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party four years ago at their conventions, that really didn't drive the agenda for the last four years. What is the issue that people are talking about today is leadership. Who can break the gr gridlock in Washington? That's what people are talking about. My question was, when is Perot going to spell out his position on the issues in the minds of American voters? When? Well, he's already been doing that. He's been talking about issues all along. He's been talking about issues and how you deal with these problems. He's been talking about leadership, and that is the issue. I mean, that is the issue to the American people, is who can break this gridlock. You see, the commonality of the wide divergence of views of people that support Ross Perot is driven by the fact that people understand and are asserting themselves that there is a gridlock, that we have major problems, and they don't much care about the pointing match between the president and Congress as to who is more at fault. What they want is action. How much Perot money are you going to spend in this campaign? Are you prepared to spend? Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm always intrigued uh, by those questions in that to date. I, I look at the figures today in the presidential campaigns of um, Mr. Bush and Mr. Clinton to date. It's been about $30 million, and Ross Perot spent a $1 million. Uh, that's to date. So, uh, you know, this is not a money that's, uh, this is not a factor that has driven the phenomena that's been created. It's been the millions of volunteers that are collecting. No, I, I'm not implying that. I want to know how much money you must have. You, you, you watch dollars very carefully. You must have some idea about how much money you think you'll have to spend between now and November 3rd. I, I don't have any idea uh, what will be spent between now and November 3rd. I know that, uh, Taxpayers will be financing the Republican campaign. Taxpayers will be financing the Democratic campaign. I know that the Republican campaign of four years ago spent about $100 million. I know the Democratic campaign spent about $100 million. Uh, but I don't have any idea. Have you bought large blocks of network television time for the month of October? No, sir. When is your man going to announce? I don't know. Uh, you know, what is happening now is that, again, and this is, there's nothing, uh, you know, Ross has been very consistent about this from day one. Uh, what's happening today is that volunteers are getting his name on the ballot. And I'd say uh, right now, let's see, they've probably turned in signatures to get him on the ballot in probably 10 to 12 states, but about, you know, 20 more are just about there. So it's, it's rapidly spreading across the country. Would it be unwise for your candidate to put out issue papers, positions, on issues? Oh, again, I, I don't really think that's the main issue that's uh, driving what's happening today. No, I'm not as saying Ross that. Said, I'm just asking whether it would be wise or unwise. Well, as Ross said, he's working on those right now. But again, I don't think that's going to be the dominant discussion in the months to come. I think it's going to be leadership and how do we break the gridlock. How much is Ross Perot's short fuse a threat to his campaign? <laughs> oh, I don't think there's any threat at all. Is there an appearance problem with Ross Perot's having discussed business ventures in Hanoi five years ago while working on the release of American POWs? Is there oh, an appearance was, problem he, with that? He wasn't discussing business ventures. I mean, Ross Perot has been a very successful businessman. He, he wasn't there selling computers in Vietnam. Uh, his motives and his efforts on behalf of the MIAs and the POWs are well documented. Uh, this is a man that has dedicated uh, a good portion of his life to helping people like that. He started that uh, crusade and built a consensus in this country at a very divisive time in our history, built a consensus around better treatment of the POWs. Ask nope. some POWs and their spouses and their families about Ross Perot's motives. Well, what are you uh, saying about the accuracy of the New York Times story today? 
Well, what I'm saying is, is that Ross Perot was there discussing the POW and the prisoner issue. And, you know, the fact that Vietnam keeps wanting to discuss what will happen after the POWs and MIAs are returned is, is what's been happening all across the board. But Ross Perot was, was there trying to help on the POW and MIA issue. Is your candidate's position that if this election is thrown into the House of Representatives, he, Ross Perot, would step out of it? No, well, I, I think, first of all, I, my prediction today would be that it won't go to the House of Representatives, I, I, uh, the way this movement is growing. But, you know, the Constitution sets forth a procedure to elect the president, and uh, the words of Democrat and Republican aren't there in the Constitution. This is an orderly process, there's a procedure for this, and that's what's happening. Which is more important, Ross Perot having a running mate with working with Congress experience, meaning an insider, or his running mate being an outsider? Well, I think what's most important is what uh, Ross Perot has said he'll look for in a vice president, and that's someone who can be a president, who can replace him. And uh, I think what Ross will look for, knowing Ross, is leadership, a person who can make things happen. That's Ross Perot's track record, is making things happen, and he'll want somebody like that. In deciding on your campaign co-chairs, was it important to have an inside Democrat and an inside Republican? Well, what was important was to bring uh, in expertise of people who had been through this process, who could help advise and, and counsel. Uh, and certainly, uh, given the independent nature of this drive, that was an attraction, certainly, to these two people, that, that they are symbols of the type of support that this is attracting across the board from Democrats and Republicans and independents. And so that was certainly a feature that was important. You are waging an unprecedented campaign in American political history. President Bush tonight at his news conference said, quote, the two parties will be strong after this election. You agree or disagree? Well, you know, this, this election is not about two parties. It's about breaking the gridlock. And, you know, what Ross Perot is saying is, look, what we need is a coalition government. We need to rise above the politics of today and strive for the common good. We need to be for the Republicans when they're right and the Democrats when they're right. We need to bring people into a cabinet that come from both parties. We also need to bring independents into the cabinet. We need to look for the best people. We need to set aside partisan differences and solve our problems. Then uh, Democrats and Republicans can go back to bickering. But what the American people know today, instinctively, what they know and what they understand is that we have serious economic problems. We, this is more than a temporary blip. This is more than a recession. People are worried about their long-term future, their short-term future. What will happen to their jobs next year? Ross Perot has a track record of creating jobs and solving problems. That's what is attracting so many people to him. Tom Lewis, we thank you for sharing your thoughts with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. When we come back, we will continue our coverage. Car enthusiasts have helped send the prices of some classic Jaguars to astonishing levels. But the price of one is still very affordable, the 1992 Jaguar XJ6. Introducing the Jaguar Super Lease. At just $525 a month, it's the most attractive lease we've ever offered, making the XJ6 beautiful from every perspective, including the financial one. For your nearest Jaguar dealer, call toll-free. Oh, this athlete's foot. The itching, the burning. And the odor. Phew. <sighs> Stop the itch and the odor with new Odor Eater's Athlete's Foot Cream. Odor Eater's for Athlete's Foot? Look, Odor Eater's Cream cures itching, burning Athlete's Foot while it controls that awful odor, yet it costs less than any of these. No more Athlete's Foot. And no more odor. New Odor Eater's Athlete's Foot Cream. Powder and spray, too. <laughs> It happens every morning in London, Paris, and Madrid, just as the city starts to stir. In Munich, Manchester, Zurich, and Brussels, just as the business day begins. In Glasgow, Stockholm, Frankfurt, and Milan, as the new day arrives, 
so do we. American Airlines, with over 200 non-stop flights a week to Europe from cities across the U.S. And beginning June 8th, we'll also arrive in Berlin. So fly the airline that's bringing Europe closer than ever before. American Airlines, something special to Europe. Welcome to Hotel Views, the family getaway, Holiday Inn, or Amada. Bob? Susan, you simple-minded sap. When I go away, I stay at Holiday. I go to the same room, the same restaurant, the same pool with the same wife and kids. Why change? Bob, you hangnail. Ramada has comfortable rooms, nice restaurants and pools, just like Holiday. But at Ramada, kids, including teens, always stay free. See, change is good. Don't you ever change anything, like your socks? There's no argument. Ramada's in, Holiday's out. Going now to our senior White House correspondent, Charles Bierbauer. Charles, the president's men said, boss, you ought to go on uh, primetime television. He did. Did he achieve his objective? Well, that depends on how you judge it. Clearly, the president's objective was to avoid talking about Ross Perot as much as possible, though certainly he knew he was going to have to do that. Uh, in the early going, he deflected most questions, trying to turn them back to his positions on various issues, uh, starting with the balanced budget amendment, which was his, uh, his lead-in topic, though clearly uh, everyone in this House knew that the balanced budget was not going to be the, uh, the headline coming out of this event. And eventually the president was cajoled into talking a little bit about Ross Perot, uh, when he was uh, hit with the question of what would you really say if you ran into Ross and he, he turned it by saying, well, I'd tell him I thought I'd been doing a pretty good job and I'd like him to vote for me. But clearly Ross Perot was the dominant issue here, Bernie. George Bush seemed to be saying he's too busy being president to play politics and, and flagging that uh, he's going to ignore for all intents and purposes, not only Perot, but Clinton until after the conventions. There were a couple of curious lines in that respect, uh, talking about how he really hadn't focused all that much on it. Uh, he hadn't been through the primaries, he said, in, in one sense. Well, he certainly was through the primaries. Uh, Pat Buchanan gave him an early beating, and Ross Perot seems to have picked up on that point. He said he'd be ready to, uh, to take them on, uh, meaning Perot and Clinton, after the, uh, after the conventions this summer, but... Uh, Everyone knows that this campaign's been going on for a long time. It doesn't start in September. What's the next stop for this sitting president? I think we'll see a little bit more of this sort of thing, trying to focus uh, attention on uh, the issues that Mr. Uh, Bush considers important. Uh, campaign aides concede they've had a terrible time trying to get the, uh, the focus back onto those kinds of issues, and the president himself concedes that he's not always been the most effective. But it remains uh, to deal with the personalities involved here. Uh, Mr. Bush cannot escape Ross Perot. He seemed uh, curiously to escape Bill Clinton, whose name hardly came up at all tonight. Bernie? Thank you, Charles. And for Charles Bierbauer and Bill Schneider, I'm Bernard Shaw in Washington. That concludes our special coverage of this event and Campaign USA 92. Coming up next, Larry King live, and here's Larry to tell us about his guest. Our guest is the man they didn't talk about a lot at that press conference, Governor Bill Clinton of Arkansas. He'll be with us from the governor's mansion in Little Rock, and we'll be taking your calls next on Larry King Live on CNN. Coming up, Larry King Live, followed by World News after a word from your local cable system here on CNN. There are a lot of siding companies out there. So how do you know which one to choose? Maybe you can start by asking the right questions. How well will it hold up? What about warranties? And what kind of a track record does a dealer have? I'm Bruce Carpenter with ABC Seamless Siding. And when people ask us questions, we're proud to answer. ABC Seamless Siding is beautiful and durable. It comes in a wide variety of colors. It's durable beauty that's backed by lifetime warranty. Best of all, our rolling factory arrives ready to measure your home and cut the siding to fit. So you don't see a maze of seams. What do you see? A home that looks cared for without the bother of maintenance. That means that you have more time to enjoy your home. We can help in that department too, because now 
ABC Seamless can add a little sunshine to your life. Take a look. This magnificent Better Living Patio Room can be added to your home in just a few days at a price you can afford. People all across the country say it's their favorite room in the house. We didn't want just another room. We didn't need more space to hide boxes and store stuff, and we wanted a, a place to live. I feel that the addition of this room uh, increased the property value of the house quite a bit. And the windows are so easy to move back and forth. This room, I think, gives me something to be really proud of. <laughs> It's exciting to come home. <laughs> it is. It really is. <laughs> Enlarge your home and improve your lifestyle with a better living patio room. Take a look around your home, and when you're ready for some answers, call us to find out more. Call now and save $700 on our seamless siding or patio room additions. Operators are on duty, so call ABC Seamless now for your free consultation. ABC Seamless Siding and now patio rooms, too. is CNN. Tonight, with this delegate count, we want to put the forces of the status quo and short-term greed on notice. The party's over. We're in for a change. We want our country back. Because five Democrats are out there just hammering away on the President of the United States. And I smile and say, look, uh, we'll, we'll meet you in the fall. Welcome to Larry King Live, celebrating seven years on CNN. Tonight, he survived the primary, but for Bill Clinton, the battle only gets fiercer and more complicated. The Democrats' choice for president makes his case and makes ready for a three-way race. Now, here's Larry King. Good evening from Washington. We have a thick file of political obituaries in our office from the last day's months, and they all say that Bill Clinton is through, and they were all wrong. Bill Clinton is headed for a first ballot nomination at the Democratic Convention, and this time when he gets up to talk, they pay attention. Four years ago, Clinton put the hall to sleep with his keynote speech. They said he was finished then, too. So he defies the pundits, works the system, digs in, hangs on. What if it's all for nothing? Ross Perot, he has no primary victories, no party heavyweights. Some polls have him clobbering everybody. Nobody predicted a three-way race. The new strategy says the campaign is to grab voters in unconventional ways. So last night, Bill Clinton grabbed a saxophone and jammed with Arsenio Hall's band. And now with the air full of question marks, the Democratic presidential nominee joins us from the governor's mansion in Little Rock, Arkansas. Thanks for being with us, Bill. And uh, Governor Clinton will be with us for the full hour. We'll be taking your phone calls as well at 202-408-1666. And if you live outside the United States, 202-408-4821. Charles Bierbauer at the end of the last hour with Bernie Shaw said that you were kind of left out tonight. Did you feel left out of that press conference? Not at all. I don't mind being uh, not a part of that press conference. It had a certain air of unreality to it. Uh, all that talk about balanced budgets... Uh, there are three people who want to be president. I'm the only one who's ever balanced any budgets. I've balanced 11 government budgets. I know how to do it. And uh, I found it uh, somewhere between amusing and amazing that uh, Mr. Bush was up there plunking for a balanced budget amendment, which could put off the responsibility to submit balanced budgets beyond his presidency. I mean, this, uh, we have quadrupled the debt. And he has never come close to presenting a balanced budget. So are you, are you saying, uh, it's Governor, amazing to me. You're opposed to that amendment? Well, the way the amendment is worded, I have real problems with it. L let me tell you why. There are three ways to balance budgets. You can cut spending, you can raise taxes, or you can invest and work your way out of the deficit. And the way this amendment is worded, it would severely restrict our ability to invest and work our way out of the deficit and in fact could aggravate recessions. If your revenues drop off because you're in an economic uh, slowdown and you raise taxes, you're just going to make it worse. Uh, I've got a plan to do uh, what we need to do, which is to put discipline back in this budget. We ought to have a line item veto. We ought to cut defense more than the president wants to cut it, but still leave ourselves with the strongest uh, defense in the world. We ought to limit, wait a minute, we ought to limit health care costs 
to inflationary growth over the last four, next four years. That is the biggest growth, and he refuses to take on the health insurance companies, the drug companies, the health bureaucracies. That's where the money is being eaten would, up in our tax dollars. Would President Clinton submit a balanced budget soon? I would present a five-year plan to balance the budget. Uh, I would do it in the same way I've done it for 11 years in Arkansas. You know, I've already cut spending twice since I've been running for president. If the money's not coming in, there ought to be an automatic mechanism by which you can restrain spending. And if they appropriate money up there, they just go on and spend it whether the money comes in or not. Uh, I think there are lots of things that can be done to put discipline into this process. But the one difference I have with the, with the, the Bush administration and some of these folks in Congress is they, they don't make a decision between money you invest in the future and money you consume. Uh, the problem I have is that we've increased the deficit and reduced investment. If we were borrowing the money the way businesses and families and state and local governments do to build, let's say, a high-speed rail network, a fiber optic network, put people to work building the economy of the 21st century, I wouldn't mind staggering the payoff over the years uh, when you're getting the payback on the investment. But what we do is we run a deficit every year just to, to eat. We consume our seed corn, as we say down here in Arkansas, and that's what's the matter with this budget. So you need real discipline. I would impose that kind of discipline. I'd have spending cuts. I'd have revenue increases on people with very high incomes whose taxes went so, down in the 1980s while their incomes went up. And I would have real increases in investment to put this country back to work. You're saying then that President Bush can do what he is asking an amendment to do? Absolutely. Tomorrow, in a heartbeat, the only thing he needs from Congress that I think they ought to give him is a line item veto. I disagree with the Democrats in Congress who won't give him a line item veto. But otherwise, he could present a budget tomorrow. And by being for this constitutional amendment, he lets himself off the hook because he knows good and well, even if it passes, it won't come effect until the next president's in office, even if he gets reelected. And that's wrong. He ought to show some budget discipline. He has presided over quadrupling the national debt. Governor, were you shocked that you were not mentioned a lot at this conference, that the name Perot, thus far a non-candidate, was mentioned more than the soon-to-be Democratic candidate? No. Didn't Why not? bother me. Well, it's the moment's rage, you know, and he said we, uh, I think Mr. Perot said we could uh, balance the budget without breaking a sweat. Well, I can tell you, as the only one of the three candidates who's ever balanced any government budgets, you're going to have to break quite a sweat to take on the organized mm -hmm. interest groups and restrain them. But don't you but get it odd so that you good. aren't mentioned by the press in questioning, the president rarely by name, that Perot was, was the story? Don't you count that odd, Bill? Well, I, it, it may be odd. Folks like you have been uh, pumping him up uh, with no program, but with things that sound good. So it's just one of these things. It's going along fine as far as I'm concerned. Well, what I do you think do... it means? I mean, folks like us put him on the air. We I'll ask him questions, he answers. The public likes him. What, are, what other kind of ball game well, is there? I think the public's smart enough to know that you can't cut $180 billion in waste, fraud, and abuse without breaking a sweat. Uh, I believe that in the end, the people are going to want proven leadership and people who've done things rather than just talked about doing things. And I'm, I feel good about that. I, you had uh, the preliminaries here which explain what the problem is. The American people are so disgusted with both political parties, and I don't blame them, that anybody who's gone through this primary process winds up weaker coming out than they went in because you become like a politician. Frankly, I was relieved not to be mentioned at that press conference tonight because it was so much more about politics than substance. I want to be associated with direct talk to the American people about what we can do together to solve our problems and get this country moving again. Why, why are you running, do you think, third? Why? Yeah. Because I'm the only one. Strong because party, you're the Democratic Party, the majority party in the House and the Senate. Every prominent Democrat has now announced for you. Why are you running third? Because the Congress is unpopular, the Democratic Party is unpopular, and the political process uh, required uh, me to go through these primaries and get beat up long after the others weren't. I mean, if I had a billion dollars and could just enter the primary, the general election, without going through it, that might be a big advantage. And you could control your access to the people. Uh, but what, what I think will happen now, I don't really know why. I mean, who knows why? Mm -hmm. What I think will happen now is the American people will think, well, they've got three choices. And they'll give us all a look. They'll give us a look at the conventions. They'll give us a look at our town meetings. They'll give us a look 
in those debates, and I certainly hope there'll be debates. Uh, so Among far, I've three, right? You bet. No. I've agreed. I, I've agreed to start now on the deficit and go through every issue as many times as any of these people are willing to debate. I'm ready to do it. I think the American people need to see us all talking about their lives, their problems, their promise. And I'm not worried about these polls. You know, I've been, as you pointed out, my obituary has been written eight times this year. I didn't get into this race to live in the White House or go to Camp David on the weekends. And I just soon live where I'm living now and have the life I've got now. I got into this race because I wanted to change this country, invest in our people and our jobs again, and and get this country moving again. That's why I got in the race. And so the more debates, the merrier. And I'm not going to give a second thought to the polls until we get down a little closer to Election Day and the voters have had a fair chance to look at all their choices uh, stacked up against one another and what they really have to offer America. This uh, may be hard to do, Governor Clinton, because you're so in personally involved. What, what is, in your opinion, Perot's appeal? I mean, why, why, obviously, he's showing strong in the polls. That can fade. Oh, well, Anything can happen. But what is it? I think there are two things there. Uh, one is he criticizes the system and says both parties have let us down. I agree with that. Maybe it's just uh, where we come from. You know, we were born about 35 miles from each other, and that sounds great. The other is, he says, I'll fix it. I'm a fixer. Mm -hmm. Vote for me. And the American people in electing a president want somebody who will fix it. They're tired of the finger pointing and the blame placing, and they think both parties have let them down. Now, to be fair, the voters have voted for divided government for 12 years, and that's part of our problem. My argument is different. My argument is, look, I'm the only one running who's actually worked in government to make it work, to help create manufacturing jobs at 10 times the national average, to educate children and adults, to move people from welfare to work, to bring people together across racial lines. I've actually done these things, and I've also put a plan before the American people. I don't claim that you can do these things without breaking a sweat. I think they're hard work, and they require good ideas and a lot of effort. But uh, that's my case to make to the American and people. And obviously you think you have the time to make it. You bet I do. We'll be right back with, let me get a break, we'll come right back. Governor Bill Clinton's our guest for the full hour tonight. We'll, of course, include your phone calls. This is Larry King Live. Don't go away. Larry King Live is brought to you by GMC Truck, the strength of experience. Around 1900, GMC Truck built America's first gasoline-powered truck and went on to make trucks our only business. A heritage of trucks that, some say, worked a little harder, lasted a little longer. And that's still true today in a truck that gives you the most standard payload and the strongest resale of any full-size pickup. Sierra, from GMC Truck, more proof of the strength of experience. Coming home, coming back to the things that comfort you when nothing else will do. Stover, nothing comes closer to home. Home style beef pot roast with oven brown potatoes. Fried chicken breast with real whipped potatoes. All your favorite home cooked meals. Stover, Stover, nothing comes closer to home. Dear Thompson. Honey. I ran out of Midway the through waterproofing our new deck, I ran out of Thompson's water seal and finished with another brand. So Two days later, it rained. It was amazing. Wow. You could actually see side. the Thompson side working. The other side looked like I hadn't used a yeah. thing. Terrible. Thompson's water seal has 50% more active ingredients than most brands for more waterproofing power. You can see the difference. For my money, nothing tops Thompson's. And I proved it. Sincerely, Marsha Jack alone, Bassett, Wisconsin. The miracle Grow No Clog 2, it's three feeders in one. It's a soft and gentle feeder for delicate flowers. It's a wand feeder for hanging baskets and hard to reach plants. It's a fast feeder for lawns and shrubs. The miracle Grow No Clog 2 feeder. I'll have a Big Mac and small fries. You get the same thing every time. They have chef salad, filet of fish, chicken fajitas. Come on, live a little. Okay, I'll have a Big Mac and large fries. You're a wild man. 
Our guest, Governor Bill Clinton of Arkansas, your uh, uh, fellow Governor Mario Cuomo of New York, speaking in New York today, said that he thought Ross Perot's appeal was much like Fletcher Christian and mutiny on the bounty, and that everyone's standing around knowing the ship's in trouble, and he's saying, let's do something. But he also added that if, if he were to give you advice, he would say, don't run, Bill Clinton, as an outsider. Don't run outside the party that's not going to win in a three-way fight. You agree? I agree with that. I have run to change the party and to change the country. I do believe the Democrats have to change, have to offer a real investment strategy to get this economy going again, a real education strategy, a strategy to control health costs. I think the Democrats also have to insist that we impose some more responsibilities along with the opportunities we're giving people. I think we need to take a, a, some different approaches. But I want to run as a Democrat because that's the only way I can demonstrate to the American people that we can pass a program through Congress and get this country moving again. You know, we have uh, two branches of government uh, that have to work together mm -hmm. in order to move this country forward. And you can see what we've got up there now, paralysis and blame placing and finger pointing. And uh, I know that I can pass a sweeping legislative program in the first hundred days through this Congress. As I know a, I can do it. As an inside the Democratic Party man. As a person who's inside the Democratic Party, but outside the Washington establishment that's responsible for the paralysis of the last 12 years. Okay. If you look at these three candidates, of all three, I have been the least involved in lobbying and in creating and in supporting the system that exists in Washington today. What I try to do is to live with the with the consequences of it out here at the state level, running balanced budgets, investing in jobs and education saying, and Mr. making things go. Mr. Bush is closer to Mr. Perot than he is to you and Mr. Perot to Mr. Bush than he is to you. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. If you look at, at, the, at just their experiences and their, their, who they've run around with and what they've done and how they've worked together. I mean, they obviously they don't like each other very much right now, but I'm the one who's actually been out here on the firing line trying to make change, not being a part of the, uh, okay. of the rules that Governor, have been set up in the last 12 years. We want to get the phone calls. So I want to touch some other bases quickly. Ron Brown, chairman of your party, said that if they have to go to the House, if, this, if no one gets the required electoral votes, all Democrats have an obligation to vote for you, even if you finish third. Do you share that view? I don't think that's going to happen. I'm I mean, but do you share the view if it did? I, I don't expect it to happen, and I'm not running to finish third. I'm running to win, and I think there will be a clear and decisive winner in this contest. You don't think there's a chance it'll go to the House? Oh, I suppose there's a chance, but I'll be surprised if it does. Uh, the American people uh, have a pretty good compass, and they get a pretty good sense of where we are at a moment in history and, and who ought to be given the chance to lead. And I think if we, all of us, have the courage of our convictions and we'll just get out here and debate these issues. If nobody runs and hides and nobody tries any quick fixes and gimmicks, if we'll just open ourselves to the American people, I think they'll make the right choice. Uh, I'm committing to you tonight that uh, I'll come back on your program to debate uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Perot. I'll go on any, I told the ABC I would do it the last night to talk about the deficit. Uh, I will do as many debates and as many forums on as many issues as the others are willing to embrace. I, I see no reason to deny the American people the opportunity to have an honest and open discussion. That's what we did in the primaries. I think that's what we ought to do in the general. We're going to take a break and go to phone calls. How did you assess the president's overall performance tonight? Well, I thought he was uh, upbeat and aggressive, but I thought that there was a sort of a, a hollow note about this balanced budget amendment. I mean, a bunch of Democrats got it up to try to put some discipline into the process and he's now embracing it because that excuses him from having to present a balanced budget. He would never have to do it. It all happened after he left office. We'll be right back with Governor Bill Clinton of Arkansas. He's at the governor's mansion in Little Rock. We'll start to include your phone calls. He's our guest for the full hour. This is Larry King live in Washington. Don't go away. Car enthusiasts have helped send the prices of some classic Jaguars to astonishing levels. But the price of one is still very affordable, the 1992 Jaguar XJ6. Introducing the Jaguar Superlease, 
At just $525 a month, it's the most attractive lease we've ever offered, making the XJ6 beautiful from every perspective, including the financial one. For your nearest Jaguar dealer, call toll-free. When you travel a lot, one hotel begins to look like another. But only Hampton Inn guarantees you'll be completely satisfied or your night stay is free. So you always relax in a clean, comfortable room for a good night's rest. Our continental breakfast is on the house, and local calls are free. Call today for this free directory or make reservations now at the one hotel you can always rely on. Call 1-800-HAMPTON now. Yoplait, calcium rich, active yogurt cultures, now 99% fat free. That's why Shonda Sawyer does it every day. Smooth, creamy Yoplait, do it for you. What used to be done the hard way, today can be done the easy way. Roundup kills grasses and weeds, roots and all, in sidewalks, along fences, and in driveways. So instead of pulling weeds, do something that you really want to do. Nothing kills weeds better or easier than Roundup. Of all denture adhesives, only one holds the strongest. And it's just taken a turn for the better. Fix it in its new easy twist cap. It's bigger, it's a snap to open. And it's one more reason to fix a dent and forget it. When important people have something to say, they say it on CNN. His choice. It was a tough choice. I chose him. Get in touch with the people shaping the news. Watch Newsmaker Saturday with Charles Bierbauer. Saturdays on CNN. I need your assistance, Jim, in getting out the message now tonight, loud and clear, on what the president said about the balanced budget amendment. And if you can get an editorial or two on there saying this is a good idea, it would help enormously. I don't think you can do that, but if you could, I'd welcome that kind of support, because that's what the American people want, and we've got to get that message to the Congress. We're going to go to calls momentarily. Uh, some quick comments, if you would, Bill, on some of the other things that uh, President Bush said tonight. Not willing to give up sanctions to end fighting in Yugoslavia. Agree? Not willing to what? He's not, he's not willing to give up the sanctions if that might end the fighting. Would you give them up if you were president? Well, I would be guided, I think, by what our European allies think and what, we can, uh, what kind of consensus we could get uh, through the United Nations. Uh, I think we ought to try to get a ceasefire, and I think we ought to be prepared to be flexible about what the conditions of a ceasefire are. No committing of any American troops? I wouldn't rule it out if it were part of a UN peacekeeping force and if it were uh, to enforce a ceasefire. The crime bill, you favor it? The uh, crime bill the president supports tonight? I favor uh, large parts of it. I'm for a lot of the tough law enforcement uh, provisions that he talks about. But I have to say, once again, the president has, on crime, said one thing and done another. He could have had the Brady Bill a year ago, which would have required a waiting period uh, before people bought handguns so you could check for their criminal or mental histories or their ages, keeping guns out of the hands of people who don't have any business. And he didn't want that. He, uh, he has actually cut back on aid to local law enforcement officials the kind of things that would enable us to hire more street police to have community policing and do things that we know reduce crime so uh, i'm for tougher penalties i'm a supporter of capital punishment we have it here at home i'm for stronger penalties uh, for serious offenders uh, i've built a lot more prison cells but i also think the police on the street need more help and uh, we ought to pass the brady bill and that's where he ought to direct his energy so he's playing politics with the crime bill too Let's uh, start to include some phone calls for Governor Bill Clinton, Washington, D.C. Hello. Hello. Uh, I've, I'm a Democrat. I haven't voted for the last two presidential elections, and I'd like to ask uh, Governor Bill Clinton uh, why I shouldn't vote for Mr. Perot, why I should vote for him. You should vote for me because, unlike either of the other two candidates, I have spent the last 11 years out here at the grassroots with people just like you working with people to make government work. Uh, we created manufacturing jobs in this state at 10 times the national average. We've improved our education system dramatically, including uh, quadrupling the number of adults in education programs so that they can earn more money. Uh, we've moved people from welfare to work. We've made government work. You should vote for me because uh, I have proved that I care enough to fight for this country and for people like you, and because I'm the only person who's actually got a plan 
to invest in our country. I have given you a plan to invest in our jobs and our education and our health care. Just other people are just talking about it. That's why you ought to vote for me. Indianapolis for Bill Clinton. Hello. Indianapolis. Hello. Oh, I should hit it down. Indianapolis, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, Governor Clinton, it sounds like you have yes. a lot of good ideas, and I'm trying to weigh them all out. Uh, how are you going to stop the gridlock in Congress? How can one person do it? And what kind of luck do you think Ross Perot would have as an outsider? Well, I propose to do it uh, in two ways. First of all, I have been more specific about what I would do than any person who's ever run for president. And I've done that for a very good reason. I think if you're clear and specific with the voters, then you can go to the Congress and you can say, look, here's what the people voted for, pass it. Secondly, I strongly favor some political reforms in Congress. We gotta reduce the influence of PACs, limit the cost of congressional campaigns, open the airwaves to honest debate, so you get more responsive Congress people to the public at large rather than the special interest. What do you think of uh, Perot's idea of electronic town meetings that would include key figures from Congress appearing with the president, answering calls from viewers, discussing problems and having experts dealing with those problems in front of the public. Oh, I think that's a good idea. Of course, uh, I was the first person to do that in this election. I started having electronic town meetings in New Hampshire during the primary, and I've continued it right through California, so I agree with that. I think that's important. But I think in the end, you hire a president and a Congress to make decisions. I don't think that that's going to be an accurate poll that will tell you what to do. I don't think that, you know, you can't uh, get out of the responsibility to make decisions for yourself. Let me just say one final thing in response to the ladies' questions. Uh, I have actually passed sweeping economic and education reform programs through a legislature. I know how to do that. I know how to get it done. And I think because I'm a Democrat, even though I'm a different Democrat, I'm from outside Washington, I have a much better chance than Mr. Perot or Mr. Bush do in actually passing this program. I think you will see between now and election time, the leaders of Congress actually say, we like Bill Clinton's program and we're going to help him pass it. Uh, any leaning yet on vice president? No, I'm working hard on it, and I want to make a very good decision as soon as I comfortably can, but I'm taking this very seriously. I want the American people to say, boy, Bill Clinton's running with somebody who'd be a good president. I think that's the number one criteria. Bill Bradley has taken himself out. If you put him in, would you talk to him to change his mind? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, if I'm he came up in your well, I've bailiwick. Known Bill I've known Bill Bradley for a long time, and I don't think that he's going to change his mind. He, he's a very firm person set in his own convictions, and he's made it very clear uh, to the world that he wants to help me win this election, but not as a candidate for vice president. He thinks that that's inconsistent with his job right now, and uh, I think you have to take him at his word. So that boy, he will not be on the ticket. Right? Well, you, I think you have to take him at his word. He's okay. an extraordinary man, but... And I'm glad he wants to help win this election, but I think you have to take him in his word. Will, the, uh, will it be a good bet that the, the person running with you will be a current elected official? I wouldn't rule out uh, others, and I'm not in a position now to say I don't want to eliminate anybody now. I'm working hard on this, and as quickly as I have a decision, I'll share it with you. Will we know it before the convention? You might, uh, but I think the most important thing... Uh, as Warren Christopher, who's heading this uh, project for me, along with Vernon Jordan and uh, Governor Madeleine Cunin of Vermont, the former governor of Vermont, uh, they say that we got to know that we're comfortable with this decision. I want to make it as soon as I can, mm -hmm. but I want you to know that I have done everything I need to do to examine the choices and, and work it through. We'll be back with more of Governor Bill Clinton and more of your phone calls on Larry King Live. Don't go away. Okay, boys. A one, a two. GMC Truck has been planning your getaway for over 80 years and has put all its experience into a new vehicle with the luxury of a leather-trimmed interior, the safety of anti-lock brakes, the comfort of a soft-ride suspension package, and most important, all the strength you'd expect from a truck company.
to let you make the leap away from it all. The new SLT Jimmy from GMC Truck. More proof of the strength of experience. Welcome to Hotel Views, the summer getaway. Holiday Inn or Ramada, Bob? Thank you. Susan, you heat rash. At Holiday Inn, you get a place to eat, a place to sleep, and a place to swim. Come on, it's a perfect vacation. Bob, you compost heap. Ramada's got great rooms, nice restaurants, and refreshing pools, just yeah. like Holiday, but at a better price. And now with Ramada's summer sale, you and the family can get away for as low as $39 a night. You could save it up to buy some breath mints. There's no debate. Ramada's in, Holiday's out. Of all denture adhesives, only one holds the strongest, and it's just taken a turn for the better. fix it -in's new easy twist cap. It's bigger, it's a snap to open, and it's one more reason to fix a dent and forget it. Looking for adventure? Then just pick up your CNN scorecard at electronic stores with this display. Then tune in to CNN Sports tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern and watch for your numbers, and you could win the trip of a lifetime. He talked about pornographic material depicting individuals with large penises or large breasts involved in various sex acts. On several occasions, Thomas told me graphically of his own sexual prowess. I will categorically say I have not had any such discussions with, with Professor Hill. Larry King Live continues, followed by World News after this local commercial break, next on CNN. Stained glass, beveled glass, etched glass. Stained glass overlay can put exquisite designer glass into your home or business at a very affordable price. SDO Craftsman can quickly create a beautiful design on your windows, shower doors, or any glass or plexiglass surface. Visit a stained glass overlay showroom. See breathtaking designer glass and handcrafted entries. You'll be impressed by the exceptional beauty and high quality. For more information, call 226-9111. 100 years. That's a lot of history. There's a dean, a man, and a wizard of Oz. And while the names change, the legacy lives on. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! Thursday, June 11th, many of the Redbirds' greatest players return to Bush Stadium. A hundred years, thousands of memories, and one special evening. Don't miss the Cardinals' centennial celebration. For ticket information, call 421-3060. I'll see you there. This is CNN. I'm sure there will be debates, and uh, I will be ready to join the fray after the conventions, but as you know, uh, I have not challenged uh, directly either uh, Perot or Clinton, Mr. Perot or Governor Clinton. I have no intention of changing that. Uh, do you know, uh, Governor Clinton, what he meant by that? Uh, he's willing to debate but not to challenge? No. Uh, but I would challenge uh, both uh, President Bush and Mr. Perot to discuss these issues in, in public forums where we can really get into some detail. The American people are entitled to know whether we know very much about these problems. Well, we know Mr. Perot said he will. Our, Do you expect the president to? Do you expect that we will see some? I don't know. But if, he, if, if uh, Mr. Perot and I agree to go across the country uh, debating these issues and discussing them uh, and getting into some depth and dealing with them, uh, I would be very surprised uh, if uh, the president in the end didn't have to join us or be hurt very badly in the polls. I think that the American people don't want politicians who hide. They want us to get up front. They want us to talk to people like you and answer your questions. Mm -hmm. And I think they'd like to see us talk to each other. You know, in, in the primary, I bet I did 15 or 16, maybe more debates, and uh, it didn't hurt a thing. The American people, I think, want to see us out there working through these issues. Dayton, Ohio, as we return to the calls for Bill Clinton. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I, with the voter uh, turnout down the way it has been for the last few years, um, I'd like to know what he's going to do to restore the trust in the government. Well, there sure is disinterest in the, in the primaries. Well, I think that there's disinterest for good reason. I think people think that, that the political system has let them down. But I would also remind you that uh, the people are in the driver's seat at election time, and you can't drive the car if you don't get in. Uh, what I'm going to do is to try to talk about the kinds of real problems that people have talked to me about. 
and I'm going to try to, to do it as directly as I can with people like you. Uh, yeah, but why aren't you they know, turning out in the primaries, Bill? Well, I think one of the reasons is that, that so much of the coverage is dominated by polls and positioning and handicapping instead of the real problems. I, I hardly ever meet an American who isn't worried about the future. Uh, their jobs, their health care, their kids' college education. Uh, this country has serious problems. I think right now people despair about whether the political system can solve it. What my job is, is to get out there as directly and, and clearly as I can mm -hmm. and say, hey, we've been around for 200 years as a country. We have made it for 200 years because the real problems of our people have been solved by this political system. More than half the time, the voters have made the right decision at election time. You gotta get out there, you gotta vote. And I know there's some problems with the political system. I've got a plan for reform of the political election system. Uh, I've got a plan to get, make it easier for people to go vote, but you're still gonna have to believe in your country enough to go and vote. For people to stay home, uh, frankly, is a cop-out. Uh, after all, voting produced the arrangements which have given us the paralysis too. So we've all got to take responsibility for changing our country and staying home instead of determining that we're going to invest in this country again and make America competitive again and bring our economy back again. That's what we need to be doing, not staying home and copping out. Gaithersburg, Maryland. Hello. Yes, hello. Mr. Clinton, Ross yes. Perot said that uh, he wouldn't hire anybody for, he wouldn't appoint anybody for his uh, cabinet who's been involved in an adulterous situation because he said if you would lie to your spouse, I can imagine what you would do to me. I wonder how you feel about morality in your political appointments. Well, I, I think morality is important, but I don't know how he would know about the private past of every person he might appoint. Now, he said it for uh, unless, a public, unless, I think he clarified, well, I think they clarified well, on ABC by saying have, that if it were public knowledge... Well, I mean, I don't know what he means by public knowledge or whether he intends to use investigators to look into people. I mean, I, my own view is that I will look for the best people that I can. I will appoint honest, good people who won't violate the public trust and who will promote uh, work and family and progress. But I'm not going to get in the position of uh, trying to meddle into or overly uh, snoop into the private lives of people who want to serve honorably in public service. I think that's a mistake. Okay. And I don't think we've got a person to waste. I think we need all the talent we can get in this country I think working what, on solving these problems. If a person, let's say, where he, I think he said were a known homosexual that were questioned about it and had to discuss it publicly, he would not appoint him to the cabinet. You disagree with that? Well, I wouldn't rule out uh, letting people serve in high positions in government uh, because of their marital history or because of their sexual orientation. I wouldn't rule that out. I, I don't, I'm an inclusion guy, not an exclusion guy. I want people who are on the team and who believe that we ought to bring this country back uh, economically and politically. Uh, I am pro-family, pro-work, and I, and, and I think we've got to focus on that. I think all this business about investigating people's private lives is a big mistake. Washington, D.C. for Governor Clinton. Hello. Hello. I was just at, curious about the motives behind Mr. Clinton appearing on the Arsenio Hall show and if he wonders if that might have the same effect on him or his campaign as it did to Michael Dukakis getting into the tank. The playing the clarinet, no. I guess, is the question. Do you think that was kind of uh, light stuff? Well, my, it was light stuff. Uh, they invited me to play, but it's part of who I am. I've been playing since I was nine years old and I enjoyed it. And it was something I was comfortable with, and I think that's a big difference between that and Michael Dukakis getting into the tank. I respect Arsenio Hall. He invited me to come on his show. He has a young audience of non-voters, a lot of people who don't vote, whose lives are at stake in this election, who are worried about their country and their future. And, uh, you know, he's been very serious and responsible in the way he handled the Los Angeles riots and discussing tough subjects like black on black crime uh, and I think he's a very reputable person and I was honored to be asked to be on the show I enjoyed playing with his band but I think the serious uh, talk that my wife and I had with him was far more important and I think is what will uh, linger in the minds of the people who watch the show back with more of Governor Bill Clinton we're zipping along on Larry King live more phone calls right after this
Tonight on Sports Tonight, who's going to the French Open Tennis Tournament Finals and how they got there today? Plus, what happened in Game 1 of the NBA Finals and the adjustments for Game 2. We'll talk about that and more 11 o'clock Eastern tonight. All of these children have one thing in common. All of them were unplanned pregnancies. Pregnancies that could have ended in abortion. But their parents toughed it out, listened to their hearts, and discovered along the way that sometimes the best things in life aren't planned. Life, what a beautiful choice. Yes, I get to get to my show. Let's go. Stetson Cologne, easy to wear, hard to resist. Where's that great smelling guy who got me here tonight? I got a front row seat here just for you. Ever tried plaques before you brush? Rinsing with plaques helps loosen plaque and break it up. And when you break up plaque first, then brush, you brush off more. Break up the plaque with plaques. This is Federal Express. This is Conica. Why you use Federal Express? Why Federal Express uses Conica? So if you know this company, you should know this company. Because Conica delivers for Federal Express. TNT presents a powerful two-night television event. Two doctors united by conviction. Torn apart by scandal. He killed her. He killed her! Testimony of two men. Monday, June 15th on TNT. But I also think the American people are pretty smart. I think they're going to look at the overall record. I think they're going to analyze the proposals. I think they're going to look at a person's overall values. And I think, I think then I have the confidence that it won't be just the Republicans that will be supporting me. Back to calls for Governor Clinton, London, England. Hello. Good evening, Governor Clinton. Good evening, Good Larry evening. King. Good evening. I would like to ask how you really, I would like to ask Governor Clinton how you really felt about the early riots and how you would handle such a situation if you had to do that. What would you have done differently than the president in L.A.? Well, I, I don't approve of the riots and I think in the moment there, the president uh, did what he should have done in terms of offering support to stop the riots. But we need to not only clean up the mess uh, the riots caused, we need to, to uh, clean up the mess that caused the riots. We need to, to deal with the underlying problems in our cities. We need to, to uh, have a whole safe streets initiative. If I were uh, president at this moment, I'd be out there pushing a community policing bill to put more police back on the street, working as friends with the people who live in those neighborhoods. I'd be pushing the Brady bill to uh, require a waiting period before people could buy handguns. Uh, I'd have an economic initiative to try to revitalize those areas. A lot of those People are very frustrated who live in communities, not just in L.A., but all across our country, that there's no real economic empowerment agenda in America. There's no real system by which they can get into small businesses and succeed and uh, own their own piece of this country and its future. I'd have a real family and education initiative for the working poor in the inner cities and a program to move people from welfare to work. Those are the things that I'd be doing to try to deal with the long-term problems. And the last thing, to go back to the Arsenio Hall, uh, show again i'd be trying to reach those kids that are in the gangs on a consistent basis you know all of us want to be in some kind of gang we want to be in a group that's bigger than ourselves uh, and a lot of those kids need to be told that if you'll stay in school and play by the rules uh, we'll send you to college or we'll give you an apprenticeship program you can have a a future that means something those children need to have activities and work and relationships with caring adults. If I were president now, those are the things that I'd be working on in L.A. and all across this country. Carmel, California. Hello. Yes, sir. Governor Clinton, how do you yes. feel about the fact that uh, potentially you could be send, sending men into combat to die as commander-in-chief, and yet as a younger man you skipped out on your responsibility in the military, sir? Well, I opposed the war in Vietnam, and you know that. Uh, my responsibility was to be subject to the draft. Uh, I was. I joined an ROTC program because I didn't want to go to Vietnam and I felt badly about it, got out and put myself back into the draft and I was never called. Those facts are clear. But since then, I have commanded the National Guard in my own state. I have put down a riot at Fort Chaffee. I've called out the Guard in other life-threatening situations. And uh, I don't have any problem 
with doing that. We've had a number of successful presidents who were commanders in chief who themselves did not fight in combat, including President Roosevelt, who was combat eligible in World War One and, and didn't serve. So you have, I, I don't I don't have a problem with that. You have no problem either, Governor, emotionally signing death warrants. Is it what well, is it easy emotionally? Of course, it's not easy. It's tough. Well, I didn't but, say it's easy, but I mean, isn't it? Uh, there are some who say, you know, there's no redress of grievance. If you execute in Arkansas an innocent man, you are guilty. Well, they may say that, but uh, in, in the case... That'd be case true, of, wouldn't it? In the, in the executions we have had, Larry, that's, that's why you have mm -hmm. an obligation to review them all very carefully. We uh, have had uh, three people who killed more than one person. That is, they were mass killers in public, everybody, and, and one person... Uh, who was a police killed a policeman who was in the act of arresting him actually two of them killed law enforcement officers one of them mm -hmm. killed two uh, others too so i don't uh i don't think that that is an argument against capital punishment those decisions are tough and if you have any doubt about guilt uh then you shouldn't do it but if if the if the guilt is clear and the jury and the judge have acted within the law and you support the law and i do support capital punishment then i don't think the governor should get in the way Little Rock, Arkansas, for Bill Clinton. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question for the governor, as an Arkansas voter, is when he says that he has balanced our budget, why doesn't he acknowledge that he's only doing what the state constitution required him to do? Well, that's true, but all states require balanced budgets, and yet many state budgets are imbalanced all the time. That is, they may get balanced at the end of the year with massive layoffs or cuts or huge tax increases. Uh, if you look at our budgets uh, through the last 11 years, because of the system we have, uh, we're in more or less continuous balance. It's a much more disciplined system than, than many others, and I have uh, actually supported legislation to strengthen our revenue stabilization law so that we can keep in current balance. I think we've done a very, very good job of that. It is true that our Constitution requires it. If we had the right kind of balanced budget uh, uh, legislation in Congress, I would be prepared to support that. But the point I want to make is that uh, the president should be out there actually recommending a more budget restraint. The truth is that if you look at the last 11 budgets in Washington, the deficit is actually a tiny bit smaller than it would have been if all the Reagan and Bush budgets had been adopted just as they were presented. Hmm. That's the point I want to make. You can't, you know, on the one hand say a balanced budget, and on the other hand, increase the debt every year. We'll come right back with more of Bill Clinton and more phone calls on Larry King Live right after this. Stay there. If you get married and have children but then go outside the home to work, you're a bad mother. If you get married and have children but stay home, you've wasted your education. And if you don't get married but have children and work outside the home as a fictional newscaster, you get in trouble with the vice president. Hello, I'm Susan Rook at CNN Center in Atlanta. At the top of the hour, a complete wrap-up of this evening's political campaign events. And as the president talks budget balancing, the Congress puts the final touches on a plan for next year's Pentagon budget. Plus, Earth Summit 92. Those stories and much more on World News, right after Larry King Live. It's a beautiful morning. Was it the color television? Gonna ride roller coasters, French fries. Or that kid's 12 and under stay free. Six, seven, eight, milkshakes too. Or the great location. One thing's for sure. It's a beautiful morning. Days in. Isn't it time you wake up to us? I think I'll go outside and just smile. Shark. What you need is. Shark. What you need in facts is. Shark. Shark thinking about business. It made us number one in fact sales. Created the world's first desktop. Color, color, color facts. Color facts. Shark. And the affordable, high quality laser plane paper facts. Shark thinking about facts. The right facts at the right time, right now. From the number one. Number one. Number one. Number one. In facts five years in a row. Shark thinking about business. This was me with dull gray hair. I looked washed up. But color my gray? Not me. I found a whole new way to make my gray look great. He discovered a new kind of shampoo called Great Looking Gray. Great Looking Gray not only cleans and conditions your hair, it gets rid of the dullness. Gets rid of the yellow, too. 
Ordinary shampoos can't do all that. What a difference it makes. Now, make your gray look great with great-looking gray shampoo. My name is James Ford. One capsule twice a day, okay? I'm an echo pharmacist. You will feel better. I'm also the chairman of the Cocoa Housing Authority. I'm scheduled this week. Yeah. I'm very involved with the Sickle Cell Foundation. Okay, I'm familiar with that one. And a youth program called the Young Men of Distinction. I'll call tomorrow for you. You know, I got this friend that says, does that man all the time you spend helping people? I said, no. That's what a naked pharmacist does. I think the two-party system has, has really given us the most stable political system in the world. And yes, we're going through an unusual period, but uh, the two-party system has provided us fantastic historical stability. And you look around the world and compare this system with any other democratic system, uh, and I think that would, that would avail. The next caller for Bill Clinton is from Tokyo, Japan. Hello. Right. Uh, hello, Governor, Governor Clinton. Yes. Um, there's a couple of points that I'd like to make. Uh, first of all, I can just say I have a lot of respect for some of your positions. Uh, but you, you are What's the question, support. sir? Sorry? The question. Yeah, the question is... Um, relates to some comments that you made about Ross Perot uh, after the primaries when you said that he, spend, he wants to spend enough money to get into the White House. I think it's a bit oh. of a slander on no, the Oh, you didn't say that? No, 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 no. no yeah, let, let me clarify. I'm glad you brought that up because I do think that it was subject to that interpretation. That's not what I meant. I pointed out that because he has enough money to spend as much out of his own pocket as the rest of us who... You know, I've made $35,000 as a governor for 11 years, never taken a pay raise, and it's limited by the Constitution. It's fine with me, but my point is that because he's in that position, he can enter this race and stay in this race, not having had to go through all the primary competition that, and being able to communicate directly with the American mm -hmm. people. I was just making the point that it's a big advantage in this day and age when the parties are both unpopular if you can just say I'm running and here's my direct communication with the American people you, that's all there are some Washington insiders who thought the president's calling this press conference some think an act of desperation would you go that far oh uh, you know I don't know about that I don't want to characterize him or Mr. Pro or anybody else I just you all make that decision all right I'm just telling you what some people in news think uh, anything in this campaign you regret Oh, sure. I, you know, I'm proud of the campaign we ran, but I wish that it had been on the issues from start to finish, and I wish that at the end of it, uh, I had been successful in making sure the American people knew more about the basics of my record and how we've actually changed people's lives here in Arkansas. There are people working, businesses going, kids being educated who wouldn't have been otherwise, and I wish people had a clearer sense of my program for the future, of why I think we've got to have a greater partnership between government and the private sector to invest in our education and our jobs again. I wish that there were a clearer sense of me out there, but part of that is just the nature of the primary process, the nature of the coverage, the nature of the conflicts that uh, develop. But I regret that very much, and uh, I'm just grateful that I have apparently won the nomination and that we're going to have this opportunity to get out here and debate these issues now. We'll be back with our remaining moments with Governor Bill Clinton of Arkansas after this. Hello everyone, I'm Karen McGinnis at the CNN Center in Atlanta. Larry King Live will continue with Governor Bill Clinton coming up in just a few minutes. For Friday afternoon, we've got some cooler temperatures which will pick up across Canadian border states, but the temperatures start to climb across the southeast and the mid-Atlantic. Still rather cool across the northeast and New England thanks to a lot of rainfall. There's been a lot of rainfall which has been picking up across the mid-Atlantic and flash flood watches out for sections of Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina. Fresno look for 101 degrees <laughs> rather hot uh, coming up for Friday afternoon. Los Angeles at 78, Portland, Oregon 75. Now these forecasts coming up for these cities.
provide both driver and passenger side airbags. One of them is a Lincoln. And the other one is a Lincoln. With Lincoln, it's easy to be on the safe side. Lincoln, what a luxury car should be. Used to be, folks couldn't wait to try Uncle Ben's rice. Now you don't have to. Uncle Ben's fast cook rice. Light, separate, perfect. Everything you already love about our original converted rice in about five minutes. The energy to go further. We share that energy at Texaco, leading the way in exploration, conservation, alternate energy. The energy to go as far as we can and then go even further. Your painting arrived today. I must say, it really is quite, quite different. Do we hang it with the squiggly bits at the top or the bottom? The Parker Duo Fold, guaranteed for a lifetime of self-expression. Why Centrum Silver? Because you're over 50 and you're just hitting your stride. Centrum Silver Vitamins. Because the latest scientific research about changing nutritional needs after 50 is built in. Centrum Silver. It's a great time to be silver. That lady for hire for the evening may be someone's teenage daughter. What do escort services really provide? We'll ask a former teen escort and prostitute tomorrow on Sonya Live, 1 p.m. Eastern, only on CNN. We're running close on time. Corvallis, Oregon. Hello. Yes, Mr. Clinton. I would like to know why you spent $30 million in your campaign where Perot has spent a million. This doesn't seem to be very cost efficient to me, so how well, are you... Well, didn't have to run in primaries, right? That, that was the point I was making earlier. I, I had to go through all the primary campaigns. I was uh, totally unknown when I started from a very small state. Uh, I was running dead last in the primaries, I think, in, uh, in New Hampshire when I began. So I, I had to run through all those primaries to win the nomination. Uh, if I'd been a billionaire and could have just entered the scene, maybe I would have considered doing that too. Madam, well, I do me, think the two-party system has done some good things for this country over the years. Did you agree with the president's statement on the two-party system? Uh, yeah, there's no question about it that over time, America has had a stronger democratic system because of the stability of the two-party system. Uh, there's also no question that every now and then the parties need a little shaking up, and I have come at this from a different way than Ross Perot. I tried to reform the Democratic Party from within. I've advocated very tough campaign finance reform, and restrictions on the influence of special interest, but I still believe that our democracy will work better if we have two parties that function uh, rather than just splintering apart. Think you're going to win? You bet I do. No, no. Not for me, but because I stand for something, because I got into this race to fight for the people whose lives I've seen uh, limited by what we've done for the last 12 years. Thanks so much, Bill. See you again Thank soon. Thank you, Larry. Governor Bill Clinton, the governor of Arkansas, already with more than enough delegates to be the Democratic nominee at the convention in July. CNN atop the scene. Speaking of atop the scene, tomorrow on Inside Politics 92 at 4.30 Eastern, Ron Brown, who we mentioned earlier, chairman of the Democratic Party, will be the special guest. That's on Inside Politics with Bernard Shaw and Catherine Cryer, tomorrow, 4.30 Eastern. We'll be with you in an hour on the radio, back here again tomorrow night. Susan Rook will anchor the news at the top of the hour. What's up, dear? We will continue with the political theme, Larry, with comprehensive coverage of today's political news, including details from the president's press conference and the latest on Ross Perot. Also, who would become president if there's no clear winner? Then at the half hour, our special Agenda Earth, including the Global Warming Treaty and whether it means anything. World News is next. I'm putting my confidence in the people, saying we're going to get something done and take the case to the American people on the issues. And uh, that's the way I think you ought to do it. Coming up, World News, followed by Sports Tonight, after a word from your local cable system, here on CNN. When I was a kid growing up in Iowa City, a high school coach once asked me how good I wanted to be. I told him I wanted to be the best that I could be. Somerset Mom once wrote, it's a funny thing about life. If you refuse to accept anything but the best, you often get it. Stanley Marcus of Neiman Marcus said, as a merchant, I've discovered that people who expect the best merchandise also expect the best service. Once they find it, there's very little reason to shop anywhere else. 
For almost 40 years, Reichardt's has sold quality merchandise for men and women designed to stay in style for a long time. We alter and repair clothing for the life of the garment free while you wait if necessary. We'll gift wrap mail anywhere in the world free. We offer credit and we make clothing made to your measure if you're difficult to fit at regular stock prices. And no sale is ever final. All of us at Reichardt's are really trying to be the best that we can be. So you'll be satisfied for a long time when you shop here and I can see that you are because I'm here. I'm Bill Reichardt and I own the store. Please come see us. Your first child, it puts you on top of the world. And at Iowa Lutheran Hospital, you'll find all the special care and comforts you and baby deserve. Like single room maternity suites, your own personal nurse, the most advanced birthing classes, even environmentally safe cloth diapers to protect your new one. For a tour, call 263-BABY. You'll see that Iowa Lutheran Hospital is committed to making your world a little more wonderful. At Crescent, our people make the difference. Friendly professionals ready to help you find the right car, truck, or van at the right price. And provide reliable, convenient service after the sale. Crescent Chevrolet Geo. Downtown for 60 years. Friendly Crescent Chevrolet. This is CNN. President Bush pushes a balanced budget amendment in a primetime news conference, but has little to say about Ross Perot. Perot, though, talks about him. He finds it fascinating that the president is even interested in a balanced budget, and he says he's ready for a tough campaign. This is CNN's World News. What you need to know what you want to know with Susan Rook and Patrick Greenlaw. Thank you for joining us. Patrick Greenlaw is off. Our lead story tonight is out of Washington and more specifically the East Room of the White House. President Bush holding a news conference seen largely as a means to counter rising interest in fellow Texan Ross Perot. The initial agenda, legislative matters. But CNN's Jill Doherty reports the focus quickly shifted from George Bush the president to George Bush the candidate. You want. President, President Bush President wanted to talk about a balanced budget amendment, and that's how he began just his second formal primetime news conference in three years. He announced that he'd signed $8 billion in cuts in the federal budget that Congress had sent him. But much more, he said, is needed. And tonight, I am more convinced than ever that a balanced budget amendment is the only way to force the federal government, both the Congress and the executive branch, to live within its means. But from there, it was straight down a path of questions the president didn't want to answer. Mr. President, I'd like to ask you about Ross Perot. I'm sure there will be debates, and uh, I will be ready to join the fray after the conventions. So why is the president trailing Perot in the polls? I think um, most people would concede that, that my problems stem from this sluggish, anemic economy. I think you can trace that uh, those problems to getting bigger with that. The president was asked how his leadership stacks up against Ross Perot's. I say, take a look at what happened in Desert Storm, where I didn't have to get anybody else's action. I moved. I saw a threat. I did what was required, and I didn't have to get a Congress controlled by the opposition party to move. The people saw leadership and action there. But Mr. Bush also admitted some aspects of his pre-Desert Storm policy towards Saddam Hussein had failed. But we tried to work with him on grain credits and things of this nature to avoid aggressive action. And it failed. It failed. President Bush described this election year as a funny time, a time warp. But come the fall, he says, voters will support him. Yet even at this press conference, Mr. Bush found it virtually impossible to get away from the subject of Ross Perot. Jill Doherty, CNN, the White House. Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton criticizes the president's push for a balanced budget amendment as a political move. A few minutes ago on CNN's Larry King Live, Clinton said it looked good for the president to support it because he would never have to submit a balanced budget. 
He was also asked if he felt left out to the president's news conference. Well, I don't mind being uh, not a part of that press conference. It had a certain air of unreality to it, uh, all that talk about balanced budgets. Uh, there are three people who want to be president. I'm the only one who's ever balanced any budgets. I've balanced 11 government budgets. I know how to do it. And uh, I found it uh, somewhere between amusing and amazing that uh, Mr. Bush was up there plunking for a balanced budget amendment, which could put off the responsibility to submit balanced budgets beyond his presidency. In San Antonio today, Clinton addressed the American Association of Retired Persons. He pledged to protect Social Security and try to bring down health care costs. He also focused on children calling for full funding for the Head Start program. Ross Perot, meantime, is closer to getting on another state's general election ballot. Supporters in Nevada submitted petitions from all 17 counties today. Perot thanked campaign volunteers at a rally in Las Vegas. He ridiculed what he called the president's sudden interest in a balanced budget. And he told the crowd he's ready for anything in the campaign ahead. It's going to be hard, tough, dirty work. It's going to be like making sausage. It's not pretty. But if we stay together, we can do it. We will make mistakes, but we won't make the kind of mistakes that are being made now. And I promise you one thing. If you put me up there and if you stay with me, I promise you one thing, I will not beat around the bush. Perot is topping another poll. 34% of Florida voters asked in a Miami Herald survey support him. 31% are behind George Bush. Clinton gets 22%. Well, Perot's strength is only one unusual twist in this year's race for the White House. There have been so many surprises, not even the possibility of an indecisive presidential vote sounds out of the question. CNN's Bob Franken reports. If the Ross Perot independent campaign prevents any candidate from getting enough electoral votes, the House of Representatives would choose the next president. Members would have to decide whether to follow their conscience, the majority of their state's voters, or as the National Democratic chairman says, their party. Well, obviously we would hope and expect uh, that all uh, Democrats in the House of Representatives would support uh, uh, the nominee of their party, uh, Bill Clinton. Meanwhile, House Republican Whip Newt Gingrich, well, a Bush a supporter, supporter, says party uh, loyalty Bush should myself. not be automatic. If we were to end up in an election thrown into the House for the first time since 1824, all of us would have to frankly listen to the American people and do a lot of praying. I think that would be such an extraordinary moment that you would have to stop and try to ask what really would be good for America. And I just didn't want our candidates to automatically say anything at this stage because I think it's too historic a moment. Under the U.S. Constitution, voters indirectly choose the president, actually selecting electors. The Twelfth Amendment specifies that president and vice president must be chosen by a majority in the Electoral College. If there is no majority there, then the House chooses the president. The vice president is selected by the Senate. It's happened before, twice. Thomas Jefferson won the first, John Quincy Adams the second. And some believe that with Ross Perot, anything could happen, including heavy political pressure. The real possibility. And unless the House determines its procedures with clarity, then you could have a situation where this chaos could result during a very turbulent period of time in this country's history and the American people would not have the confidence that the system is working very well. Under the Constitution, the House decides who will be president by a majority of states, but only one vote from each state, regardless of population. The Senate, on the other hand, chooses the vice president with the majority of all members. Republicans Michael. say they'll make sure the process is as public as possible. If it's not open and if the rules are stacked against us, uh, my guess is we'll try to take actions uh, on the floor to slow down the process enough for the country uh, to uh, understand uh, what's going on. And if the House and Senate deadlock, then the Speaker of the House becomes president on Election Day until the deadlock is broken. Bob Franken, CNN, Capitol Hill. And this reminder, Democratic Party Chairman Ron Brown will be the guest tomorrow in CNN's Inside Politics. That's at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The presidential primaries behind him, Patrick Buchanan, is tending to personal matters. Tomorrow, he will undergo elective heart surgery to replace a defective aortic valve. Buchanan's sister and campaign manager says his outlook is excellent.
Buchanan's bid for the Republican nomination embarrassed the president to end some early primaries. He later lost steam. The so-called Biodiversity Treaty, which protects animal and plant species, is expected to be signed beginning tomorrow at the Earth Summit. U.S. refuses to sign unless some changes are made. But world leaders attending the summit in Rio did sign the Global Warming Treaty today. Agenda Earth, CNN's nightly special on the Earth Summit, will air less than half an hour from now. That's at 10.30 Eastern. And there's much more to come on this edition of World News just ahead. Ticket counters are jammed, travel agents are swamped, and passengers are very happy. It is the final 24 hours of the airfare frenzy. Then at 15 after, will more U.S. troops come marching home from Europe? It's possible under a new Pentagon budget plan. Then at 25 after, is it Love Me Tender or Viva Las Vegas? The winning Elvis stamp is finally revealed. Car and Driver magazine declared its road manners are in the import vein, but comfort is better. And if you're wondering what else they have to say about the new Oldsmobile 88 Royale, call 1-800-332-OLDS. We'll send you their complete test drive evaluation on video cassette, free. Because when Car and Driver says the new 88 has hit the elusive style mark, it deserves more of your time than we can give it here. Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. On a 10-minute call to France, MCI now saves you 57% over AT&T's basic rates. To England, 53%. Italy, 57%. Introducing friends around the world, the lowest price.